Okay, uh, so seeing a presence of a quorum, I'm going to call a meeting of the Amherst School Committee to order at 6.45 p.m. Uh, for those of you who have been sitting in the audience for the past 45 minutes, we really appreciate it. Uh, we had a regional school committee executive session just prior to this, so thank you for your patience. Um, tonight's agenda uh, is pretty packed, um, but we're starting with approval of minutes. Um, of January 22nd, which was a joint session, and then also uh, February 7th. So I will give the committee a moment to take a look at the minutes if they haven't already done so. Once again, reminded of the incredible amount of work that goes into preparing these minutes Indeed. on a regular basis, especially when we have so many meetings back to back. So thank you, Ms. Westman. So whenever the committee is ready, I will take a motion. I move to accept the uh, approve the minutes of January 22nd and February 27th. February 7th. 7th, sorry. Yes. <laughs> uh, do I have a second? And actually, I'm sorry, Ms. McDonald. So we've got um, three sets of meetings uh, minutes here. So we've got the joint session, which we participated in. Um, so there was a meeting on the 22nd that started at 6 o'clock. Uh, then we move to the Amherst School Committee Those at 7.30, and then this, so it's actually three. Okay, so Sorry. I will amend my motion. I move to approve the minutes of our joint session on January 22nd with the Regional Committee, the Amherst Committee meeting on January 22nd, and the Amherst meeting on February 7th. Great. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Demling. Any comments, edits, questions? <coughs> All those in favor? Signify by raising your hand. Thank you. Unanimous. Okay. Uh, next on the agenda, we have committee announcements. Do we have any announcements from the committee? Mr. Dunley. So another meeting, another update on the national privatization war against public schools. Um, I just wanted to give a, a brief um, shout out of support and approval to the West Virginia teachers who successfully enacted a strike to stop charter school legislation in their state. That was, that was very nice to see. And on the heels of the Los Angeles strike, the Oakland, California teachers are now at, at, on strike. Again, a central issue there is privatization, a district that's gone 26% charter. And following the LA uh, strike, we, there's now fast-tracked legislation in California to increase transparency mm -hmm. uh, for charter schools. So that's good. Um, less encouraging, though, is are the uh, proposed changes to the charter school reimbursement formula in our own state and Charlie Baker's uh, H1 proposal. Um, this would, uh, doesn't change the funding formula at all to make it more equitable, uh, and it decreases the reimbursement to schools. Um, and the real challenge here, I think, strategically in terms of trying to uh, defend pub public schools from privatization is that the strategy is really to take advantage of all the attention, all the good attention, all the righteous attention on the foundation budget formula. So whenever you see uh, updates in news articles about education reform in Massachusetts, it's about that that funding battle, which is good. Uh, and this is just part of that bill that's sort of chugging along. So um, it's going to be a challenge, I think, for schools to keep that on the forefront to make sure that that does not get uh, uh, passed as part of the overall budget bill. But um, something that we should be aware of as a committee and, and that the public should be aware of as well. That's great. Thank you, Mr. Dunley. And I know that uh, Tracy Novick from the MASC mm -hmm. has been uh, on top of this for some time here in Massachusetts, um, has been sharing updates through social media and elsewhere. So she's our regional representative, which is just a great contact for, for this issue. Any other committee announcements? Okay. Uh, with that, then I will uh, open up public comment. Um, we are... Uh, in public comment period, if anyone wishes to make a comment, please come up to the microphone and uh, state your name, and you have three minutes. Okay, seeing no public comments, <laughs> we will close public comment. Thank you, Mr. Yes. <laughs> we have our handy uh, 
countdown clock over here, but I guess we don't have to use it tonight. So, um, and with that, we'll move on to the superintendent's update. Sure. So I'm doing it orally again uh, tonight. Um, so uh, just four or five things I want to share. So in terms of legislative uh, efforts, um, I shared at the region last night that um, I was one of the presenters in an event uh, for superintendents in Hampshire and Franklin counties um, talking about the impact of state funding formulas on Western Massachusetts schools in our area. Uh, I think I mentioned also that Friday there's another event of Connecticut Valley Superintendent Roundtable with um, includes Ham Hamden County as well. And Mr. Demling has agreed to uh, join me as a school committee representative, so thank you um, at that meeting to communicate our needs to our local legislators. So thank you, Mr. Demling, for making the time for that. A um, couple other things. Um, so tomorrow, no, Thursday, excuse me, uh, Ms. Cunningham was invited and the district was invited. Um, the Commissioner Riley is visiting UMass Amherst. Um, a little flyer if anyone wants to see it and print them out to save trees. But... Um, it's, he's doing something called Change the World, Become a Teacher, um, recruiting a new generation of educators to reflect the energy, curiosity, and diversity of public school students. So he's trying to do events at, at some of the university campuses. And so our district in Springfield were chosen to accompany him on this visit to talk to folks. And Ms. Cunningham and Mr. Gordon, who you met a couple months back, are going to represent the district at that event on Thursday afternoon at UMass, which is great. Um, uh, from a uh, follow-up on the ADA audit presentation from last month, uh, yeah, I think it was last month, uh, three, three visits have been scheduled with the consultant group um, to come in. CPAC's been notified as well as administrative um, leadership to work on how to prioritize that list. Um, so those meetings are all in the next two and a half weeks. Uh, so we should be able to come back to you next month with um, some more concrete thoughts. I know we're talking about capital later tonight. Um, it's still at the open placeholder level because mm -hmm. we just need to schedule the meetings. But I think the first one actually is in, uh, within the next week. Um, so they're going to come back and, and work with us on how to do that and how to make a multi-year plan to address the accessibility needs in our buildings. Fourth thing was that, um, I know we're talking about this later, but just to quickly reference that I appreciate staff members who came to the MSBA Statement of Interest listening sessions that we held. So we held three sessions, one at each of the three elementary schools. I thought the feedback was very helpful, um, and I'll share that feedback with um, Mr. Logue, who's the facilitator, so he can integrate that feedback into the final report. I appreciate Mr. Demling for showing up at the Crocker Farm session, which I thought was well attended, and I thought the conversation was robust. Um, and the last one is next week, I guess it's after we'll meet next Monday, but um, March 6th uh, is our something we started last year, which is having a kindergarten registration and information night. So it's not necessarily where you just like go and register your child. It's actually with all three of our elementary principals, inclusive, and then we're inclusive of Pelham as well, to share about our schools, um, what we offer, and give families and children the opportunity to meet some of the leaders in their schools uh, before they register and join us. Um, there was really positive feedback last year from families. We had about 65 people come last year. It was a little tight in the Crocker Farm Library, so Ms. Chamberlain is nice enough to be uh, welcoming us to Fort Rivers Library, which is a little more spacious, uh, given the, the population that came last year. So we'll have an advertisement for that in the bulletin this week as well. I think that's my update for tonight. Great, thank you. Any questions for the superintendent? Okay. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Morris. Thank you. Um, so the next item on the agenda is uh, an issue that I wanted to raise with the committee. Um, and it's uh, titled on the agenda, Length of School Committee Meetings per School Committee Policy, BEA. Um, I've had a number of conversations, I think, with some individuals on this committee, um, also with community members and with Dr. Morris, with staff, uh, and per in particular, just in relation to the length of our committee meetings, um, many of which tend to go over their stated agenda ending times um, by quite a bit. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think we all have uh, sort of resigned ourselves to the fact that that's just kind of the way that it is, right? We, you know, we sit down and we have to deal with a lot of really, you know, weighty topics, um, oftentimes uh, have a lot of, you know, really good conversation and discussion around these issues. But the reality is that there's a, a very, uh, you know, important side effect um, that ends up happening. I think we have staff here that are here from early in the morning. Um, that are forced to stay, you know, way past their normal end times. Uh, we have an impact on custodial staff. 
Uh, we also have an impact on the public uh, that attends our meetings, um, and of course on us, right? And so I think uh, for all of those different reasons, it's just been weighing on me for, for some time now, and I wanted to bring it up to the committee because it was my, to, much to my surprise that we actually have a policy around this. Um, and uh, the three you know, plus years that I've been on the committee, not once have I ever seen this policy uh, or had it raised um, <laughs> during a committee meeting. And so I thought you know, this is probably a, an important time for us to, to bring this up, right? Um, I think to both you know, show, uh, lead by example, uh, about how we could actually hold more efficient uh, and timely meetings. Um, but also hopefully set the stage moving forward. Um, I think you know for any future school committee members or school committees, uh, but also future superintendents and staff, uh, being able to set reasonable hours and times for our meetings actually makes a lot of sense, right? And um, I, I don't think we can you know argue much against it. Um, although I'm, I'm happy to entertain any difference of opinions. Uh, but I guess I, I wanted to bring this to committee to just see, it, you know, what people's initial responses were. I don't know if you've had a chance to read the policy, um, and I have some ideas on how we might be able to help cut back on, on some of the, the longer meetings that we've had. Um, but I just wanted to see your reactions and, you know, if people are willing to give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Dunling. <laughs> I mean, I'm looking at 11.27 p.m. for the adjourn on the meetings. I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Chair of Um Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things. I think we talked about this before. It's, it's, it's one of those symptoms of public service and school committee that it could just, it's this infinite well of opportunity. And the, the meetings, it's, it's like nature abhors a vacuum, right? If we have, if we allow ourselves the possibility of going to 10 or 10, 30, 11, then we will go to 10, 10, or 30, 11. And I think most of the time, it's, it's, not, it's not wasted. Time, I, th I think it's it's quality. The conversations are good. You know, the the, the input we're getting is 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 good. It's just it's just unbounded. Um, so um, yeah, I mean, a couple of things. I, I did like the the technique in the policy of once you hit two and a half hours, mm -hmm. that you actually have to have a motion to continue the next half hour. Um, so it's not like oh you have to adjourn at, at two and a half hours. But I think that would be, it's actually a good built-in reminder that oh you know what. We actually shouldn't be obligating us and the public mm -hmm. and the staff to stay forever. You know, we ought to be, be uh, being efficient. Um, I think it's been hard the last couple of months, given the extraordinary amount of additional um, meeting time that we've that we've freely taken on for the building project. I mean, we, we knew that going in. We talked about that at the time. I think in mid December, and so that just is what it is. But I think that that's that's kind of part of it. Um, uh, I th uh, personally, I, w I would be more amenable to more frequent but shorter meetings. I find myself after three hours not nearly as effective a, a listener and an absorber of information um, as, uh, as, as I, sh I think I should be. So I would, you know, it's like I would rather meet twice for two and a half to three hours than once for five to six hours. Um, but um, yeah, I, I certainly think that it's it's something that we should we could do a better job <laughs> haranguing. Yeah. And I think it, you know, honestly speaking, um, just going back and reviewing some of the the video from our previous meetings, which I did in preparation for for this conversation, um, you know, we could probably all do a better job of being more efficient in how we deliver our remarks, right, and how we have our questions. And I think even. Uh, oftentimes we, you know, we call on uh, educators and staff to make presentations, uh, you know, reminding that, you know, it's my job as a chair to help remind the, you know, the, who's presenting and the committee uh, when they've surpassed certain times, right? So just so we can keep the conversation going and we're not getting stuck in one, one spot. Um, but I do think that we can all do a better job of just, you know, being a little bit more disciplined around that, you know, and making sure that we're, we're stating to that. Mr. Nakajima. Yeah, um, when we talked about this the other day, so we know what I'm going to say, will sound familiar to you anyway, is, I mean, a couple of things. I mean, one, you know, some of it you actually saw me do last night, because um, I was trying to model this at the regional committee, of asking what's the point of a particular, not, not, that sounds wrong, what's the objective of a particular item on the agenda? What are we being asked to do that evening? And then focus, the, and then is, you know, how is this sequenced within other activities or meetings? And then trying to discipline what we do around what's actually being asked of us at that particular moment. Um, 
I want to. I I'm just saying from from my view that is always a useful exercise because one of the biggest problems we have is we open up an item and it seems like we could almost like the aperture is so wide we could go anywhere with it and yet the reality is frequently either it's a discrete presentation it's an update on something there's a specific vote that's being asked or in fact there's no vote and we're actually going to have another 15 minutes on it next meeting and once we are aware of that structure then I think we have to impose the discipline of saying look we, we only need 15 minutes to talk about this mm -hmm. tonight if there, and if there's substantive work to be done that's got to be contained if there's a relevant subcommittee or maybe there should be a relevant subcommittee they should be taking on the work of, of crafting and revising <coughs> something or bringing it back I also think that and again you saw me do a little bit of this last night in another meeting where I'm using the actual parliamentary procedure to start saying look we're actually doing something here so let's actually get the motion going let's get the rules of debate going I know that can feel sometimes it's artificial or formal or imposing but it actually has a really good rhythm to it of getting people to think oh that's right we're doing this thing we're on this topic are my comments germane and are they concise and I think um, depending on what we do I would be open to the I mean this maybe I don't know what this would be it's like the ending the filibuster in the US Senate it could be it could be like the the third rail um, we could have a clock or actually a structure for discussion where people are limited to a certain amount of time and I mean I don't mean the public I mean us mm -hmm. and we just we go through it and if we discover that we needed more time then we say we ask ourselves well is this something we're supposed to do this meeting or you know what I mean we question what we're doing rather than just blowing it out for another hour yeah Mr. Donald? Um, so I totally agree on, on that. I, it was um, one of the things that I've um, s struggled with, frankly, when when I first started on um, on the school committee, was understanding these agendas and what you just said um, about being more specific about what we're trying to talk about specifically because uh, around a topic that's listed on the agenda. I think can help us a lot. Mm -hmm. um, in focusing the conversation and deliberation that we have at these meetings. So, you know, sabbatical vote. Well, unless you know the history or, that, that's probably a bad example, um, but um, I don't know, maybe I'll just stay with that one even though it's not a great example, but un unless you have the history and know sort of the lingo and the abbreviation, so it's, it, you're not gonna know what that means other than, you know, the roof at Fort River. Well, is it, what, what does that mean and what precisely are we going to be talking about? And I think sort of laying that out in the agenda up front can help focus us and keep us and not talk about, you know, the shingle over there that fell off, but we're talking about the project to replace it or, you know, something, something along those lines. Um, it also can help the public in understanding sort of what we're going to be talking about so that they don't have to watch every single video to know and track what's happening across the time. I will say, I also, I, 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 I think you said, Mr. Demling, that we have good conversations. So I don't want, like, that's my fear, is I don't want the mm -hmm. pendulum to swing all the other way. Um, and I wonder if part of it is we're biting off more than we can chew in, in our agendas, right? We're, you know, you've given 10 minutes for this topic, but we've probably already eaten up eight of that. <laughs> so, and, and yet not everybody's had a chance to weigh in. So I, I think, you know, being more realistic in our time setting in the agenda and prioritizing how many of those topics we try to address. And I'm, I totally agree with what you said, Mr. Demling, about more frequent, shorter meetings is a lot easier to to manage mentally and physically <laughs> than you know these once a month or a couple times a month five hour marathons, um, mm -hmm. and a lot easier from a family perspective. So that you know future people wanting to join or run for a school committee, it makes it something that's not as t terrifying, yeah. um, frankly. <laughs> yeah. right. Well, I think that there's also, you know, sort of process-related uh, issues in, in putting together some of these agendas. You know, so the five and a half hour meeting was also that it was a combined, you know, meeting between regional school committee and the Pelham, you know, and Amherst, right? So it wasn't all Amherst, um, you know, and, and I think this is this tends to be a long-winded group sometimes, right? Like there's, you know, there's probably things that we can handle a lot more quickly 
Um, but, you know, we, we feel the need to explain ourselves, you know, we, we kind of explain a lot, right? And so I think that there's elements of that too that we try to factor into the agenda to make sure that we are leaving enough time for substantive conversation, but, you know, maybe we, we have to do a better job of making sure we're not just going on just to hear, hear ourselves talk, you know? Um, I do think that I, you know, uh, taking what has been said tonight can feel like I have enough permission at this point from the committee to move uh, these agendas a lot more quickly and to move our, you know, the, the conversations a lot more quickly and to really stick to some of these times too, right? Because if we have set something aside for 10 or 15 minutes, if we feel like we've hit that 15 minutes and we need more time, we can easily check in with the group and say, do we still need to, you know, to, we need more time for this or do we have to bring it back to another meeting later on? Ms. Spitzer. Yeah, so I'm, um, I think, I'm going to illustrate one of the things that happens is that sometimes if you wait a little bit to talk, then you end up with less time. So I would also argue that I think we should try to make sure that the time to speak is evenly distributed amongst the members okay. and it would be very in favor of using a clock to do that. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure I've been guilty of this on other topics of being the person to take the first lead and eating up on, on the time that we have in here. Um, and I'd also like to say that, um, and you know, I'm trying not to you know, make this all about um, some of the challenges I've been facing with these long meetings as a new mom, but I know that other members of the community, other members of the staff have met some of these challenges, and I know that sitting for this long is difficult overall, but it's particularly difficult for me right now as a nursing mother, so I think we either need to set a hard end time for this or work in a half an hour break mm -hmm. to accommodate some of the needs of, of, of our school committee members. And if we can't do that, um, it's effectively shutting me out from participating in these meetings. And I would hate to tell somebody not to run for school committee because they're considering um, being a parent. So, um, but that's kind of how it's it's... It's been experienced by me right now, and I know that other members of this um, staff, public, everybody's been having these challenges. So, um, and I'm sure that other people have other things that have gotten in the way. So I don't want to make it all about that. But I think we either need to make sure we're held to these times. And I'm a little concerned if we have the vote and only one of us is experiencing one of these personal things. It it could be difficult to. Um, you're in the minority, so therefore, how do you end up? You know, you. <laughs> How to accommodate the, the needs of the minority as well? Because I'm um, I don't think we'll ever have a you know, uh, majority of us facing the same issue at the same time. So I don't know if that's something to think about. Um, but a, as you think about it, I think it, it could be a host of things. I'm sure I'm not aware of all of the challenges that people face, but um, that's my personal experience. Mm -hmm. Morris, yeah, if I could just briefly jump in, um, I think. One of the things in talking to my colleagues who have similar split districts, by split district I mean that everyone on this table, all of you are members of more than one school committee, is there's a natural propensity for what we jokingly call agenda creep. Mm -hmm. um, because you do meet more often, you find more agenda items to add, whereas the majority, if it was one school committee in across the state, the ma vast majority meet twice a month, pre-K to 12. And so they're sort of forced into making perhaps harder decisions about what gets on the agenda, what doesn't. Whereas the ability to have more meetings kind of allows for more agenda items to come up that, that just wouldn't be sort of possible or advisable if there was only two meetings a month. And so just something to think about that the multiple <coughs> committee thing, it not only adds meetings, but it actually adds um, the capacity for longer meetings, even though you think it would go the opposite way. It's a really common occurrence. It'd be interesting with Tracy Novak and other uh, MASC members have find, but from the superintendent lens, when I talk to others in similar boats, um, it's it's not an unusual occurrence that, you know, the outside perspective is, oh, there's three committees, you must have shorter meetings, you're only talking about pre-K to six, and the reality is not, it is actually um, often the opposite. So it, it's, it, this the problem you're all citing, um, I just want to, I don't know if it makes you feel better or worse, it's not unique to, to our model, um, I think it's it's actually part and parcel of some of the challenges of having a school committee members on more than one school committee simultaneously. Yeah. So how about this? Um, so I think I, I'm hearing from all of you agreement that we, you know, we should take some steps to, to try to fix this problem before it becomes a, a bigger problem um, and also to make sure we're not, you know, excluding people from this. Um, I would propose that the superintendent, myself, and perhaps our vice chair get together and think through some uh, parameters and then we can share that back with the committee at the next meeting. Does that make sense? Okay. Great. 
Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, and hopefully we can get to a place where these meetings feel like they are operating much more smoothly. <laughs> okay, uh, next item on the agenda is a budget hearing. So I'm looking to Mr. Mangano. Thank you. Uh, so this is the second meeting in our uh, budget process where we open it up to the public and get their thoughts. I'm going to do a quick update on the budget, which has changed a little bit um, since the last time. And then Dr. Morris is going to go over the proposed ads and reductions. And then we'll open it up. Mr. McGon, I'm just going to pause you for a yeah. second. Um, I'm not sure if everyone can hear you. I'm having difficulty. Okay. <clears throat> sorry, I'm, I'm a little sick. No, that's okay. Yeah, I just want to okay. make sure everyone can hear you. Um, actually, Dr. I'm Morris? sorry, just to give a little context for the public. So. Um, do you want to do just about how budget hearings work? Please go ahead. Yeah, sure. So, um, <coughs> so we'll do the presentation. Yeah, we'll, Mr. Mangano and I will present. We'll have discussion from the committee, and then if the public, it is another opportunity for the public to offer feedback and commentary. Um, so it does get reopened up. So just if if anyone's here and, and wanting to comment, there's that opportunity to come. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you can go to the next one. So uh, much like the region presentation last night, the major change from the first time we presented the budget is the health insurance increase. So we were projecting um, a 6% increase in health insurance, and the actual increase we got from Maya was a 0.6. So that was a very positive development for the budget. Um, the proposed budget is still 23838854 which is the guidance that we received from the um, Finance Committee at the time. Uh, it's an increase of 2.6% or 596489 It includes net additions of 239594 which we'll go through in a second. Um, and the chart below is similar to last time except the health insurance number, which so this shows our level of service increases and decreases. Um, the decrease for health insurance is a little greater because the premium came in, the premium increase came in lower. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Morris. He's going to go through the additions and reductions. Sure, and I think I'll do the same thing as... Uh, I did last night at the region, which I'll just briefly go over these themes and then get into the, the weeds of it so that the school committee and the community can, you know, have, have all they need to offer feedback. So uh, we did look at this, um, I think, similar to some of the other districts as we're having um, a particularly solid year. We're able to make some investments, but we also know that some of the health insurance savings is a one-time savings. So we're trying to be conscious that we don't anticipate having... Um, this stronger budget year annually. Um, so we tried to make kind of logical investments, some that we would be long term and some that we knew we need to, things that we need to do that we could do and do for a year and really solve some problems that we feel urgency around. So you can see they range from instructional materials and curriculum um, to more specific on English language edu education. We have a, a kind of significant amount of facilities. I want to be really clear, this is on the operational side. Later, we'll talk about the capital budget. This is actually on the operational side of facilities. So that, just want to make that distinction <coughs> that I'm not bleeding into capital. This is actually on staffing. Um, and also responding to our students' um, needs and incoming students as well. So um, the proposed additions, um, this is adding back. It's a small portion of the procurement officer. It was a budget cut last year with all that we're asking for on capital and hopefully receiving significant amount of from the town. Just it's support for the business office given the role that, uh, given how much procurement there will be um, that we want to make sure Mr. Mangano um, has some relief from the amount of procurement um, work, which is kind of tedious, time consuming work. Um, so that, that's an ad, small ad. Um, communications and support for central resources this is adding back of another budget cut in the past, uh, clerical, additional clerical position. It'll do a couple things. One will reorganize the entry, which we've got a lot of negative feedback on this year. We had to, because of a budget cut change where people check in in the office. It clarifies support for human resources to build their support and their responsiveness to, um, to staff members, which is critically important. And it also adds more support for communications um, more broadly. So adding the additional staff member allows us to reorganize and kind of more narrowly tailor roles at central office. Um, school committee compensation. So this is um, part of the new charter is that school committee member, Amherst school committee members uh, receive compensation. So this is adding it to the budget. Um, Structural material supplies, stipends, and consultants. This was a uh, part of a budget reduction last year, and we've kind of really been challenged by supporting uh, the instructional materials our staff need. And so this is increasing that line back to exactly where it was. 
Um, the next line is really looking at um, math, social studies, and health. So this is focusing on three areas where either because of a curricular change or a standards change as it relates to social studies and health based on what we know. We've talked about this a couple times this year, that the, the health curriculum is ill-aligned with what the current needs that we students have. So this is kind of more in the category of one-time costs that we want to build into the budget to um, really address some of these changing standards or changing curricula. <coughs> Um, increase the FTE of the science garden teacher, that's increasing a grade level. So right now it's at K-2 to and this is going up to third grade and integrating that curriculum. We need a little more time from the person who's currently on staff. Um, Co-teaching stipends and professional development, that's an offset um, for reduction in a position related to this. So this is um, stipending teacher leaders who are currently expert co-teachers in our schools to take on more formal leadership structures uh, and train their colleagues. The language materials, this has actually been talked about more than most other items, so I'm going to, in the name of time, skip over ones we've talked about before. Math professional development, this is related to creating a, a temporary position for a staff member to be our 6 through 12 um, math support specialist for next year, given the proposed changes. I know we'll talk about them later on the agenda, but this is the Amherst portion of that role. Um, English language education, the Short story is the expectation for um, doing assessments, state, give, state, run assess, state required assessments has gotten to the place where we really need uh, a teacher leader in each building to help manage that whole process. Right now it's, it's, it's diffuse and it's not, it's not functioning as efficiently and what that's meant is more days where kids are out of classrooms because we're not scheduling them as well and this is really tightening our process to support English language learners. Um, the next one down is really uh, with this need of increasing English language learners, um, software assessment and stipends uh, for curriculum development. We want to improve our English language learner program and we need some support to do that. Um, the next one down is to um, have a position of assisti assistant facility director uh, and that person's role would be um, a couple of things. One is to support the, and do offer training for the custodial staff to improve their methods and, and support their work also to support some of the HVAC and, and larger work that is being suggested in the capital plan. And this is really, you see it's a 1.0, most central office positions are shared between districts. What we're finding is that we are in reactive mode all the time with the state of our elementary buildings. We actually need to build some staff so we can be more proactive, um, which our current staffing really doesn't allow for. Um, is it okay to keep going or you want to? Just, I, I yeah. guess, uh, one quick question. The assistant facility director, is this somebody who would actually be doing some of the maintenance work themselves or would they just be in an administrative position? Not just, but, yeah. you know. Yeah. The answer is both, you know, and because, you know, I want to speak for Rupert. I know he's here, but because Rupert has an extensive HVAC background, it might be the case, and we still have to work out all the details where Rupert himself might be more, a little more on the ground given his background and expertise, and this person could do some of the ordering, you know, and some of the other work that Rupert that bogs down his time. Great, thank you. But it depends on the skill set of the person, okay. right? Um, because Rupert has that skill set. Um, the next one down is, is literally on the ground. It's the school year van driver to need, but someone, you know, our positions are generally um, part time van driver, part time maintenance, and this would have, we'd be looking for someone with H, specific HVAC experience because of the ongoing needs we have. Next one down is uh, we have a student entering who's got needs that require a full time nurse, so that's what that is. Uh, the next one down is our after school program. Sometimes we need more nursing coverage than we currently have, so even though it's after school programs, we still want to support um, the health needs of our students. Uh, next one down is human resources, recruitment, and stipends. I think I mentioned this earlier, which is really to support their capacity. Um, I think there's been a lot of feedback at multiple committee meetings to make sure that we increase their capacity of their staff to um, take on more of the efforts, and this allows for, for more of that. Preschool, we spoke about this one, the dollar amounts changed. So this is planning and exploration to expand preschool. This is um, trying to collaborate with the local Head Start, which is community action. It was $10,000, but actually the town has agreed, and not agreed, they've offered to split the cost of that with us. So they're, they're, they're planning on uh, proposing a $5,000 increment, and that makes our increment go down. And actually, as I spoke about it when in, last month, we want to have this partnership with the town. and. It was, I want to be very public. It wasn't an ask from me. It was actually Mr. Bachman, the town manager, saying, no, we should, we should do this as a shared financial venture. It's a long-term shared financial interest. So um, that's why that number changed from what was originally proposed. 
Um, Spanish courses, this is ongoing work that this year has been funded by the grant that we've received, um, but it's continuing that work into the next year working with HCC, excuse me, Greenfield Community College. Next two are CPAC and LPAC supplies, um, which I think we spoke about last time. Um, the next one down, we have a special education stabilization fund that was set up two years ago, two years ago. and because of our, you know, this is a beneficial or positive financial year, it's actually a good year to put funds into that so that when the rainy days happen, we have funds that we can uh, use, and this is for uh, funds for when we have students who enter our district with unanticipated needs that require a financial investment um, that we don't have to go into reserves or some other fund. Um, special education, this is increasing the special education secretarial staff. We've looked at their workload and feel like we really need to increase that to support um, support their work, to support special <coughs> education families and staff. Uh, the next one down is uh, we have part of this funded, so it's a point .5, but this makes a whole position for next year, which is a bilingual special education teacher, specifically thinking about the dual language program and ensuring that we have um, services that can be delivered bilingually. Um, there's a modest add to a communication budget based on feedback and things we've spoken about, and a modest add to a school adjustment counselor position to make it a 1.0. It's currently a 0.7 position at Wildwood. Um, so those are the ads. Um, can we pause just oh, for sure. a second? So are there any questions from the committee about any of the additions sure. that Dr. Morris has just reviewed? Can I ask a logistical question? Um, we don't have it in our paper mm -hmm. copy. Is it on the iPads, this presentation? Be, and yeah. if so, what's it called? It should be pushed to your iPad. Okay. It, it's page 36 of the packet PDF. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And it also should, the full document should also be in your iPad. Okay. I just got it this morning. So for adjustments, um, Staff turnover savings, this is just that we have staff retire and, and generally there's some cost savings um, the following year. Um, curriculum at ELE, there's a bit of an increase just based, there's more, every couple of years we look at how, what percentage of English language learners are in each district and how much of the central office staff is associated with them, so it's a minor adjustment based on the Amherst Public Schools having a higher percentage of ELL students as compared to all three districts than it had previously. Um, human resources, again, they've looked at their software programs and they don't need all the ones they have, um, so it's being more efficient with that, so there's some savings there. Um, we looked at the Title I grant, uh, which is currently for both Amherst and Region, has been put to only expend in Amherst um, historically, and that's because early, we believe in early event intervention, and this positive fiscal year is shifting some of those grant funds to the middle school, um, which we spoke about at the regional schools. So this is an offset to that. So we're not losing any staffing at the elementary. We're just taking on funding slightly more of the Title I funded, well, what is currently Title I funded intervention staff. These are specialists who work with uh, regular primarily regular, regular education students who are um, we want to support to be at grade level in reading and mathematics. Um, we have two fewer classrooms, just based, we have a very large sixth grade, um, so we don't anticipate as large a kindergarten coming in, so that's just a natural attrition kind of thing. Uh, health insurance is a reduction in staff. Uh, this is just, you know, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, it's just based on the overall reduction in staff, based on the classroom reduction, and also the next one that Dr. Morris will talk about. So we're building in some health insurance savings from fewer plans. And the last one is just that we have a number of students who, in the current sixth grade, who are entering middle school next year, who require paraeducators to access the curriculum. So since those students are going, the, the, the need and support will also head to the region. Uh, and budget reductions is the instructional coach. That's around co-teaching, which we're replacing with internal stipends. Um, Wildwood, the paraeducator, is to increase that school adjustment counselor to full time. There's an offsetting reduction of uh, paraeducator position at Wildwood. So, you know, it's actually comes out cost neutral. And so I also think it's worth noting, because there may be a concern about this, that, um, you know, what happens to staff? That's a lot of paraeducator reductions. And, you know, uh, and I'm glad Ms. Faye is here. So we've had initial conversations about making sure that it's not an overall reduction in paraeducators across the districts. And so we've worked on having a flexible model where if they're 
wasn't six or seven paraeducators who left the district for whatever reason, because they want advancement you know, within the district, outside it, um, that we would make sure, ensure that none of those paraeducators would lose positions or their seniority, that they would, you know, they could look at the regional uh, piece, because it's not a licensure component. There is the way there is with um, unit A staff members. So, um, well, it looks like we're reducing paraeducator positions, which is true in terms of the actual people behind that. We're ensuring that everyone stays whole, um, who's in good standing in the district. And so you could see, to Mr. Mangano's point, it actually ends up being a net reduction of 2.73 positions. That's why there's the health insurance uh, increment, and the total additions add up to about $240,000 this year. Mr. Nakajima, did you have a question? No. Okay. You gave him the look. I wasn't sure if... <laughs> I, I had something on my mind. But I, th I, think, I think you've already... It looks like the... I guess what I was, what I was worried about, not worried, but just thinking about is this is a good year if next year wasn't a good year do you feel like the ads are things that are mm -hmm. obviously they're necessary but they can sort of be managed well enough and it doesn't to me I think the answer is already yes with the possible exception of the assistant facilities director where that's something where there's just such a need presumably you're making a statement that we just got to do this even though it's obviously a new position and that's Cost. Yeah. yeah, and I had a similar question actually, Please. I guess phrased slightly differently, which is what's the long term effect of these additions, right? Because I think right. that, you know, moving staff, even if we're not necessarily technically adding them or, you know, if there's just their, their job title is changing or their, their duties are changing, um, once that position has been shifted over, there's still that, you know, that job is still being done by somebody, right? So if that gets taken away because it's a sh you know, tough budget year and we have to move them back to another location, what happens? Yeah, so I think, you know, we tried to look at some of these, you know, in terms of new curriculum materials and training. We're looking at, you know, there's a couple, that's an example of a one-time cost. We're not buying new health curriculum indefinitely. Um, and in terms of sixth grade math, we're looking at that as, you know, some one-time costs. Even the position that's supporting sixth through twelfth grade mathematics, we're looking at as a, as a not a forever type of position. So we, we did try to think of what we could do given the kind of awkward situation we're in that way. Uh, and be able to do that. When we talk about choice in a little bit, you'll see that we're, our choice fund, is, choice fund is very healthy. Um, so we do actually have a fair bit of, um, there's some limit to how much choice we can bank uh, for a rainy day. But we do have uh, a fair bit, um, we're in, the fiscally we're in pretty good shape um, around that. So we tried to be cautious about adding things that were needs and, um, and also being conscious we don't want to add things that we cut a year later. Um, and as best we could, we tried to balance those, those items. You know, like for instance, the preschools one that that could that cost could expand, right? Where this is a cost to study, you know, how the district could partner with Head Start to expand preschool access in town, right? I don't know what the resolution of that is, but it could be the ca case that I come back a year from now and saying, we figured out this model and here's the cost attached to it. So we want to be very realistic about that scenario as well. Any other questions for the superintendent? Anybody? Okay. So um, just quickly, so as Dr. Morris mentioned, um, this proposed budget includes that a one-time contribution to the Special Ed Stabilization Fund. So that'll get the balance to about $200,000, which is what we'd like to sort of have as a <coughs> sort of the carrying level going forward um, at the elementary level. Um, school choice funds supporting this budget are down to 500000 so it's below what we're expecting to bring in, so it speaks to the flexibility that we'll have in the future with school choice. Um, as everyone's mentioned, that it's a good year, so the health insurance decrease, which is making this a really good budget, is not going to happen again, um, so we do have to be mindful of that going forward. Um, and same thing, the other thing making this budget year really positive is the charter and choice tuition. That stayed level this year, which made our increase from the town um, higher than in the past. Um, so that probably won't happen again. It won't happen the same way in the future. Um, so those are just things that were our considerations when we were developing the budget. And I think one more slide and then we can... Yep, so again, this is just, you've seen this before, but it's updated for the new amount of choice that's supported in the operating budget. So the green line is the fund balance in the school choice reserve fund. The blue bar is the what we're proposing to support the operating budget each year. And the pink orangey bar is the revenue coming into the fund. So for FY20, you can see the revenue coming in is about 500, right now projected about 540,000. 
and what we're proposing to use is about 500,000. Um, so the fund balance is growing a little bit. Okay, I think that is it. Thank you, Mr. Mangano. Any questions, comments, feedback from the committee before we open it up for the budget hearing? Mr. Demling? Um, so, Sean, just having been through all of this and put, put all the details together, um, you know, we're going to be at this legislative thing on Friday talking about advocacy. And um, so I think I'd ask you this question before, maybe at a different meeting, but in terms of like the big ticket items from, from state level funding that, um, that underfund our district, um, like charter reimbursement, um, circuit breaker, um, I'm spacing on two or three of the other ones. But, but when you think about what are the things that most impact our district financially in terms of state level funding, what, what are the things that are at the top of your list? Yeah, so at the elementary level, it's a little different than the region because the regional transportation piece doesn't come into play. So I'd say, again, it's the charter, um, charter tuition reimbursement aid. Um, it is the circuit breaker reimbursement. Chapter 70, minimum per pupil aid um, that we get that goes out to the, the districts that are affected by that. Um, and because it's the town, sort of all those <coughs> funds go into like a general pot that the town dishes out to everybody. So really anything that improves the financial situation of the town is positive um, because that just means there's more in that pot that could potentially increase what the schools get. Um, but in terms of school specific ones, those would be sort of the three big ones that are realistic, <coughs> I think. Any other questions or comments from the committee? Okay. So with that, uh, we are going to open it up, the budget hearing. Um, if anyone has any comments from uh, the public, you are welcome to come to the microphone, uh, state your name, and feel free to make your comments. Okay, seeing no comments for uh, the budget hearing is now closed. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Um, and folks are also welcome to send their thoughts and questions and comments uh, via email to school committee at arps.org if, uh, if that is so preferred. Thank you very much, Mr. Mangano and Dr. Morris. Thank you. Uh, so the next item on the agenda is capital planning. So, so um, that, uh, ooh. That, that I think if we, we have enough paper copies okay. for everybody um, and I'll see if I can do that as let me introduce the topic and then, <coughs> so um, Rupert Roy Clark's here um, and so what uh, he did was take the uh, what you saw at the previous meeting of the capital planning he is now a month in I think we decided today four weeks in to his role and he's done some additional analysis on the capital <coughs> plan and kind of reprioritized some things added some things and um, so he created a document that tries to highlight uh, what's changed. So it does look at that five-year capital plan like you've seen before, but he tried to have a narrative component as well as a kind of an Excel with highlight, highlighted cells um, component to share an update and Do want to share rationale. Do you want to just rationale. hand those out now? Yeah, please. Because that way while uh, people can take a look. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I can, you just give me a couple and then, yeah. You don't have to yeah. You can just... Yeah. Pass it around. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Great. Yeah. 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 I think I'm logged in. Yeah. So these were emailed to the committee um, earlier. Yep. And I'll see if I can get it up on the screen. these in box. I'll work on getting Hi, everyone. Hello. I'm Rupert Roy Clark. Okay. And um, so what I did was I took the, um, the most recent version that you had, which was a January 11th version, uh, and um, looked a little bit at the timing. There were a few items that uh, I could revise to be a smaller, uh, smaller capital cost. There's some <coughs> stuff that I thought we could put off for a little while to kind of spread things out a little bit better. So, um, so what I did was I wrote a narrative. Uh, school by school and all school of the change that I made from that time and attached to that you have uh, two pages of spreadsheet which um, 
The yellow highlights are uh, the changes that I did. And then the blue highlights that are in that spreadsheet are items that have been taken out from the January 11th capital plan be with under the assumption that we would be winding down to one elementary school building instead of the two at um, Wildwood and Fort River. So um, some kind of big ticket items like roofing and, and paving went back in, not for the coming fiscal year, but sometime in the next five years we're going to need to address those if we still have those buildings. Mm -hmm. So that's the general overview. Um, to give you a little bit more detail, um, uh, we have some exterior door projects at um, Wildwood and Fort River, um, and I, I felt that uh, after we looked at the projects we could uh, do it for less money, so I reduced those. Um, also, the Univent uh, replacement in those two buildings, actually in all three elementary schools, um, I needed to reduce. It turns out that there's going to be some complications in replacing Univent. It's not something that's easy for us to do piecemeal spread out over time. We need to make a, a real study to figure out how we can do it without disrupting the school terribly. Uh, so I reduced this coming year's uh, capital ask. Uh, to do a little bit of planning and push that reduction into the next year uh, when hopefully we can start doing some of that replacement. Um, uh, similarly with the uh, drinking water outlet change uh, in all of those buildings, um, uh, I spread that out over three years, slightly increasing the total ask, um, but reducing it for the next year. Um, and um, lastly, or the, one of the other important items is um, uh, we had in the coming years capital plan replacing chillers in all three schools. And after looking into it, um, I feel that we could push off um, Crocker Farm at least one year um, to <coughs> reduce the big impact next year. Uh, so that gets pushed forward a year. Um, ideally, we would like to replace uh, Wildwood and Fort River next year uh, if we can get the capital funds. Uh, we definitely need to do um, Fort River as a, as a top priority. Uh, the Wildwood chiller we had a lot of trouble with uh, this past year. We did some major repairs. If we have to push that off a second year, I think that's possible. Uh, I'd rather get it taken care of sooner if I can. Um, and the other the other big item is um, I added I added fifty thousand dollars into the interior upgrades um, to try to take care of some of the air quality issues that have been uh, coming up in some of the buildings. There's some internal work that I need to do, uh, and that seemed like the best line to put it in for now. Um, so that's the quick overview. Maybe I should just open up for questions now. Anything you want to add, Dr. Morris, to, to this? No. Uh, well, actually, I shouldn't say no. Sorry, this keeps on happening. It's doing wrong here. It's kind of just loose. Yeah. Um, so I, I just want to appreciate, you know, Mr. Roy Clark's work on this. And um, I think it's been helpful to have a, a fresh set of eyes, take a look at what's possible. I mean, I think the Univent, um, not to belabor that point, was really helpful for him to identify the challenges of replacing the unit vents. It's not like you can take one out and pop one back in just because of the way they're ducted. Uh, it's yeah. the, way, the way that they're plumbed. Plumbed, thank you. I was close. Um, <laughs> and, and, and so really taking a look before we ask for capital funds from the town, because, because we know we're asking for a significant amount of money, um, to be really clear on exactly what we can do this year and what we really need for further study for future years. Um, so I appreciate that lens because when, you know, JCPC is hearing all this, um, I think it's a much more defensible position um, and I think we want to build credibility with, really with town because if you look at the four years out, there's no, small, no shortage of asks uh, coming. So I think the more we can have credibility in asking uh, for detailed information and when we need more detailed information than the big ask, saying that's what we're actually asking for. It's kind of like the electrical piece as well. I mean, I connect those two items. The Univents and Electrical, we know there's potentially problems, and so we need funds to figure out what the problems are and how we're going to solve them before we ask for larger ticket items. A, a couple of items that I, that I sort of passed over. Um, uh, we had a big ask for um, changing uh, some shingle roof at Crocker Farm, which was $200,000 next year. Um, we're really not having a lot of trouble with that, so 
um, I want to push that replacing that section of the roof out several years to when we're addressing the whole roof uh, and instead focus on the skylight issue. So I cut that 200,000 in half. Um, I put it all in for, um, for this coming fiscal year, but it is something I think that we could spread out over two years if we need to. Uh, the other thing that I didn't uh, mention to you is the um, EDA compliance simply had a $50,000 placeholder for this coming year and then nothing into the future. Uh, so I thought we should at least put a $50,000 placeholder in every year until we get some more results from that study. Yeah. I think my last comment is just as a reminder, as opposed to the regional committee, this committee doesn't formally vote on the capital plan. It goes to JCPC. Mm -hmm. um, so any feedback would be welcomed, but it's not. we're not looking for a formal vote um, because that's not the structure of this kind of request. Capital goes straight to JCPC. Thank you, Dr. Norris. Appreciate the clarification. Any questions or comments from the committee? Mr. Dumling? Um, so, so welcome, by the way. Thank you very much. Great, great to have a Thank facilities you. director again. It's, it's an exciting time to be one in, in Amherst. It, it, it is. It's been an exciting <laughs> four weeks, I'll tell you. Yes. If you, if you like HVACs and one roofs, and you have a lot of good stuff to dig, dig your teeth into. So. I, I have to beg all my guys, bring me into the, into the mech rooms and up onto the right. roof and down to the basement and the boiler. Right. I want to see the stuff. Um, <laughs> So my two questions are, are related to the um, HVAC um, replacements for Wildwood and Fort River in FY20 and the, the parking lot pave for Fort River in FY21. Mm -hmm. um, just because these near-term big ticket items do relate so closely to the conversation about a potential new building, which has its own conversational threads, mm -hmm. um, it, it, it helps for me to understand exactly when and why these things get sequenced. So um, I, th I think we heard before, um, I, I won't attempt to paraphrase the technical explanation, but I think we heard before that the those two $400,000 for this upcoming FY20 mm -hmm. for Wildwood and Fort River for the HVACs are necessary regardless of whether we have buildings coming in the next, a new building that replaces both of those next five or six years. Is that, is, is that still your, not still your, but is that also your opinion? Yes, that is my opinion. Um, the problems that we had at uh, the beginning of the school year with Wild would indicate uh, how bad it is if we have a, a, a hot week and no chillers at all. It was really unbearable. Um, and uh, it's really not possible for folks to learn in, under those conditions. Mr. Dunley. And on the, uh, thank you, and um, on the, the parking lot paved for FY21, um, if, if there, uh, so there's a separate conversation about statement of interest and in buildings and all that, but is, is that a, a pot an item that could potentially move and not, that we might not have to do at that level if, if we did anticipate that there was uh, a decent chance of replacing the building in, in the next five years or so, or, or is that, is that 470 for the paving of the parking lot coming regardless of the, that scenario? I haven't studied the parking lot, uh, so I don't know if either of you guys have some information. Mr. Mangano? So that was one of the projects we did pull off when we did the hypothetical of if we have a new building in five or six years, we could pull that off. I think the when it was put in, it's because part of the parking lot is starting to erode, essentially, and it, it's going to keep getting worse. Um, but that is one of the projects we said, if we know we're getting a new building, we could push that off and try to live with it for a little bit longer. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, so part of this is, and I'll finish, is... Um, well, I, I just want to make sure that we have a chance for, for others sure. to... So, yeah, if you want to... pause there. Okay. Does anybody else in the committee have any questions or comments for Ms. Fitzer? Um, hi. Thanks again for um, putting all this together. I, I don't know a lot about Univents, but I... They keep coming up in um, the conversations about the conditions in our schools. And so I guess I just wanted to understand whether or not, I, I think it makes perfect sense to study something before you go about replacing it, but mm -hmm. it seemed like these unit events were tied to the conditions in our schools and their need to be upgraded it is urgent. And that was the message I was getting. And I, again, don't understand the technicalities of it, but do we have any concerns about postponing the unit event? replacement, because um, it looks like that's what's happening here. In terms of indoor air quality, uh, in my opinion, the, um, the existence of Univents is not core. Uh, we have other issues that are, that are contributing more significantly, um, specifically uncontrolled moisture uh, when we've had roof leaks and um, 
uh, some changes in how we uh, keep and clean the building and, and, and keep it uh, safe. Um, so um, the Univent replacement is something that, in my mind, is something it's, these are however many years old they are, and they are due to have increased failure rates. And so this is more of a preventative uh, approach by planning ahead of time to replace them instead of having them fail and not being able to use a classroom until we can get parts and they take you know, months to get parts. So um, the preventative approach is the way I see it. And um, uh, the previous plan had, had was, was laid out to spread out that work over um, many, many years, not to do, the, do them all at once. Um, so I think putting off the first one of those by one year doesn't s significantly change our, our risk exposure. Okay. I just have a quick follow-up. Sure. I, I think one of the things that we had heard uh, quite dramatically, actually, in, in a presentation that the committee heard um, from educators earlier in the year was that uh, there had been a couple of these units that had been sparking, <laughs> or at least one had sparked. Um, so I, I guess I'm I'm pausing a little bit in response to your response to her question. Just in you know, if can we actually put something like that off? I don't know what happened with the sparking. I'm not familiar with that incident. It sounds to me like a motor failed, and that's sort of part of our normal day-to-day -day life. Is components fail and we replace them. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, Dr. Morris, and then can you can you share in a little more detail some of the thoughts you had about why studying the Univents might be helpful and some of the complications just replacing them? I mean, some things that you've shared with me might be might help put a finer point on why you'd want to go about studying these before sure. jumping in. Sure. So th these Univents have uh, pipes going to them that carry hot water in the winter and chilled water in the summer. Uh, and those pipes run all over the building um, uh, and generally don't have any shutoff valves so that you can isolate one part of the building. So you end up shutting down the whole building, draining it, cutting in new valves, refilling and getting the air out. So it, it becomes um, time consuming. Um, and uh, a lot of the pipes uh, have asbestos insulation, so we have some tremendous abatement issues that we would have to deal with especially if we don't plan ahead. Uh, so um, I really wouldn't want to start that project without knowing exactly where we needed to put valves and what abatement was involved and getting that, that organized to be done in a safe way. But you're confident that it sounds like uh, there's not any immediately, you know, sort of dangerous or threatening issues right. with these. They could wait a year. Yes, absolutely. Okay. That I, I would not have... I would not have changed the, the capital plan proposal if I didn't think that, the, if I thought we were going to be in serious trouble, I would have said double or triple the amount because we need the study and to do the stuff. But it's great to hear you say that out loud. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Nakajima. Uh, I, I think you might have answered it a second ago. I was trying to figure out whether, how long the study takes and if you couldn't take some of the money to replace the events in this coming year. Um, meaning, if, you know what I mean, if it only took four months to study it, then you have quite a bit of a fiscal year left, just take some of the money and start replacing them. I think your answer is going to be that you can't do it that way because of the shutting down the system. Shutting down the system. Not having kids and staff when you're cutting asbestos or something? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Okay. I think just the other thing to note is if you look at year two of this plan, it has a significant investment in Univent. So even though I think everyone's rightly noting it pushes it back, it actually accelerates. If you think of the original plan, it was 35 each year. This one actually has 100, you know, 120 for Wildwood, 155 at Fort River, and well, that, well something, uh, you know, I don't want to belabor the point, but so it actually has a more aggressive um, amount in FY21 um, instead of kind of filtering them out, you know, that cost out over a longer period of time. Well, I just had a quick follow up. Yeah, sure. Because, um, so if we study at this, the money's in, the, in this the next year's fiscal value budget, study. Yep. When would that mean the money would be spent to replace them? Does that mean it'd be done the following summer? Or does that actually mean it would go to bid and be done the summer after that? My hope is that uh, if we do a study, we can figure out a way to do a big chunk of each building in a summer. 
Uh, so that's why I have a larger amount the following year. Uh, and I would, we would only be able to do it during the summertime. But you think, in, in other, not to put a fine point on it, I don't put you on the spot, but what you mean then is next summer. So if this summer right. is like three months from now, yes. you mean 15 months from now we would do a significant investment? That's, that's my intention. Okay. Yes, exactly. Thanks for clarifying that. Okay. Mr. Deming, did you have a, another question you wanted to ask or comment? Um, it, it was just about the, the parking lot paving that um, if, if we're in the exact same spot we are right now with regards to buildings a year from now, if we're having the exact, exact same conversation and, and we're looking at the FY21 column and we have the parking lot in front of us um, and, and we have, a, you know, another statement of interest in the MSBA and we might, we don't know whether we're going to get that until the end of 2020. Do we then have to proceed regardless on the on the parking lot, or is that or is that yet another thing that we can, you know, it's, it, it I know it's a hard question, but the the pushback we're going to get is, well, tell me exactly what what we're going to have to pay right. if we don't get, you know, if if, if we don't have uh, any more certainty a year from now than what we do today. That's like it's it's my understanding that we can pour money into patching that will last for part of a year or maybe. Um, if we don't do a serious overhaul. So long term, it's more expensive to do patch after patch after patch and much more dissatisfaction. I imagine that we could, if there was a good chance of, of, of a, an outcome change in the building, that we could um, cut down that and do a, less of a good job to buy us a little bit more time. Is that, is that your sense? Yeah. Yeah. It's a to the roofs. Thank you. Okay. So I think that you know one of the, the comments I had made at uh, a previous conversation back in January, I guess now, um, around the capital planning is that we are certainly hearing um, enough concern from the town and from the community about making sure that we can justify all of these numbers, right? And, and you know, it, it's not to say that we're not justifying them, but I think um, we have to be able to provide strong evidence for how we came up with this, you know, and also that uh, assuming we can't make any uh, assumptions at this point about whether or not we will be accepted into the MSBA um, application this year. It may be next year, it may be five years from now, right? We have no idea. Uh, in the meantime, we understand we have these issues that we have to take care of. So there's really this difficult tension that we're walking with right now, and I'm sure you're feeling it on a daily basis. I know Dr. Morris is, yes. and we all are. Um, and yet, we still have to provide some assurance to our town leaders who will, you know, as Dr. Morris pointed out at the very beginning of this segment, that, you know, uh, we are not the ones who are actually voting on, on this money. We're sort of making a recommendation and kind of, you know, saying, yes, we agree with this or we have some concerns. Um, but we have to provide some assurance to our town leaders that this, and this has been well researched and documented and, and you know, uh, is going to do the absolute best job we can with the limited resources that we have. So. I know that there's been a lot of work put into this. Um, I feel like you know there, there is some, or there's enough difference from what we saw in January that it actually makes me a little nervous. And I feel like, and I, and I totally understand why that might be. And it, and I think in the end, it's probably a good thing, right? We're coming down in some places where you know we're sort of being more thoughtful with. But I feel like we need to do a better job of documenting that. And this memo actually starts that um, and lays it out. Uh, but, you know, I think even just showing where we were before, you know, providing some references for where this information came from, mm -hmm. um, just writing a paper trail basically that helps the JCPC and then ultimately <coughs> our town fund these projects because that's really what we want is right. we want them to fund this. We want them to be able to say that this, they feel comfortable with this and they feel good about it. Um, and I feel like that's still kind of missing. So I'm wondering if, you know, that Dr. Morris and uh, yourself, if you might be able to you know, make this a little more robust to help uh, show the thinking and where it came from mm -hmm. before presenting it finally to, to JCPC. Does that make sense? I think it's an excellent suggestion. Okay. Thank you. So uh, just two com one comment I or two comments I'd like to make. Um, one is there's, there's what gets on the list that is, you know, our best understanding of, of what we need and when, and then the price tag that goes on to it is our best estimate of that price tag. If we guess wrong and uh, we guess high, um, the money gets allocated, but then it goes back to the town. Um, 
if we guess wrong and we guess low, then we have to come back and ask for more money, and mm -hmm. that's pretty awkward. So there's a lot of pressure on us to guess high, and I think some of the previous documents were guess high. I had some higher guesses than, than maybe I wanted to make. Um, I don't know if this is reassuring or not, but um, uh, I, I, I feel comfortable having done had some experience with um, some of the renovations here in the district over the past month uh, and what those things costed out at uh, that we we could shave prices down where I did. Um, I think providing so it's based perhaps, on it's yeah. based it's based on actual you know pricing experience in terms of the pricing. In terms of the what gets on, some of it is based on our experience of, of where where things are already failing, and some of it is based on projections of expected lifespan of, of the equipment. Uh, and those two things get mixed together, and I can try to document that better, but just for your own sake, I wanted to try to clarify that. Well, I appreciate that, yeah. I think, you know, just some further yeah. documentation uh, would really go a long way in, in helping um, further explain this. Dr. Morris, yeah, and I, I think, think it's we a, should move on. Yeah, I think it's a really good idea, and I think we can think about the the reasonable size ticket items that are on here and just having you know, a small paragraph of explanation for each one so that, you know, it, it kind of gets at what I think you're, what I understand you're saying, which is some justification of where do the costs come from and what's the need. Mm -hmm. and so that it's, it's not just oral explanation, but actually there's, there's some uh, paper trail that goes along with it. And in fact, um, the process with the, the uh, Joint Capital Planning Committee, I don't have the initials fast enough in my brain, <laughs> um, involves more paperwork where there's more uh, uh, explanation going to go to them already. Sure. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. okay um, moving us along, we're uh, at school choice hearing. Sure. Dr. Morris, you want to introduce us? So each district in Massachusetts has to have a school choice hearing. It's an opportunity for the public uh, to weigh in on whether we should, in this case, continue being a school choice district or not. To clarify, it means school choice students who are currently in the district are guaranteed um, in the district regardless of this vote. It's whether we would accept new school choice students for the next fiscal year. Um, I'll give you my two cents in school choice, which is that um, for at the elementary level, it fills empty seats um, in classrooms. Um, so if we have a, for instance, grade level where there's 49 students um, in this district, we wouldn't have class sizes of 24 and a half, or, and we would have very small class sizes, which is advantageous. It's also very financially challenging, and we want to be conscious of the funding that we do receive, generous funding from the town of Amherst. So, it, you know, in that scenario where you have three classes, it fills them out to well, still well below the school mm -hmm. committee guidelines. Um, so the it's it's basically the cost that comes in from those student, uh, the funds that come in from those students supplement the budget. Um, it's it's pretty cost effective that way, and really what it does is keep our class sizes low. It f prevents us from having decision that other districts have about, do you have a 24-person first grade class? And in this community, you know, I wouldn't support that. I don't think the community would support that. And really what it does is also is it, it, it allows us to maintain full-time specialists um, in terms of where the funds go, how do we utilize them. So we were very fortunate to have full-time art, music, PE, um, library and media center uh, and technology um, teachers in each of our three elementary schools that just frankly wouldn't be possible if we were in a school choice district. Um, so it really supplements our ability to support the whole child and for that reason I would support continuing with school choice in the next fiscal year. Thank you. Any questions or comments for Dr. Morris about this topic? Okay. So this is a hearing. <laughs> so we'll go back through the motions that we did before. Um, if anyone is here and uh, to speak to this topic uh, and would like to approach the committee, you feel free to do so. Here's a microphone. Just uh, introduce yourself, please. I suspect most folks are here for something else <laughs> tonight, which is perfectly OK. Okay, seeing no one approaching the microphone, uh, I will close the school choice hearing. Uh, is there anything further from us, from the committee, that you need, Dr. Morris, on this at this time? No, we'll plan to schedule a vote at the, probably not the next meeting, because the next meeting is going to be, yeah, they, 
or maybe two after, I think. Two, me <laughs> yeah. two or three meetings after. Yeah, so, but great. it's sometime in March. Great. Yes. So in the meantime, again, if anyone uh, has any, uh, either here in the audience or who's watching uh, online or afterwards, if you have any comments on this topic for the school committee, please feel free to email us, schoolcommittee at arps.org, or reach out to Dr. Morris or any of us individually. Okay, uh, moving on to sabbatical vote. Uh, in your packets, you'll have a write-up uh, from an educator here who has been requesting a sabbatical leave, which is a policy here in the district, and a pretty progressive one, I think, and a pretty great one. It allows uh, educators to come back with information, uh, new ways of doing things uh, from their experiences outside the school district. Yeah. Dr. Morris, do you want to introduce this one, please? Sure. Actually, I want to first start by introducing the author, Chris Hagemeyer is in the audience, so thank you for coming. Um, and so um, the gestalt is I want to, um, I would recommend that the school committee supports the sabbatical request uh, for three reasons. The first is that uh, when I'm looking at sabbatical requests, the first, my first order of business uh, or analysis is, is it supporting the school or district improvement plan? And so while Wildwood's still uh, getting, um, doing some heavy lifting on their school improvement plan and continuing that work with Dr. Kristen Rodriguez, this is very, this work is very consistent with the direction that um, the team that's working on that is looking to go in. So for me, it's very consistent with uh, where Wildwood is and frankly where our district is, where we're looking for high, high engagement in our curriculum and innovative teaching methods that support um, our students to be active in their learning. Um, the second is, the second frame I have is what's the, um, how high quality the experience will be. So even if it's aligned, if I don't, in my perception is not a high quality experience that there'll be a lot of learning, then, you know, it's great that it might be consistent, but if it's not going to move, you know, the district forward, then probably not worth doing. High Tech High is kind of nationally, it is a nationally renowned set of schools in California. Uh, for the previous building project, the consultant who worked with us in the educational visioning uh, was involved in that, and I know that was very inspirational to many of the staff members who were part of that visioning process to hear from his experiences of a, a school district, and it, it, they have middle school, elementary school, and high schools in their network who are really um, thinking about schooling differently. Um, and, you know, it's not just the technology, it's actually the experiential learning. You know, I still remember this video, I'm sure Mr. Egomar does to you about high school students and, and creating a project about saving the bay. This is in Northern California. And, you know, the work they did, because they were so passionate about the experience, they learned all that core content in the, in the effort of making promotional videos and informing and educating the larger community about the impact of, of the bay that they lived very close to. Um, also, the High Tech High has a network of schools, serves a very diverse population that um, I think, you know, has some consistencies with, with our, um, our school district. It's actually uh, a higher poverty and higher percentage of Yale English language learner population than our school district, but I think consistent with our district goals around the achievement gap. And the third is that what's the plan for um, distribution? In other words, so one person goes, has this experience, what's the impact on anything more than, you know, 20 some odd or 18 students the following school year? And actually, I want to compliment Mr. Eggermeyer who reached out to me and, and we had a lot of engagement on that topic um, because that was actually my initial concern when I received the, um, the initial sabbatical request and I compliment Mr. Eggermeyer for really adding in this kind of last uh, page in a smidge uh, really about um, how this will happen because we know classroom teachers are incredibly busy. They're teaching for 80% of the day. So the question is, I think it'd be great for your students, for, for this teacher's students, but how is that going to inform a larger group of than, um, you know, 20 students a year, um, which is still wonderful, but not really consistent with the language of sabbatical. And I want to compliment Mr. Agamire for working with Mr. Yaffe and Ms. Estes to really create uh, a robust plan for distribution and how could this work really inform not just those students but the entire school population. How is it so consistent with the efforts? So for those three reasons, I'm, I'm supporting um, and would encourage your acceptance of the sabbatical request. And I'm here and perhaps Mr. Agamire might be here if there's questions that are relevant for him as well. Thank you. And this is a vote, actually, uh, of the school committee on this on this topic. It is, yeah. I should have started with that. I yeah. apologize. Any questions or comments for the superintendent, or maybe perhaps even Mr. Eckmeyer? Mr. Nagajin, do you have your hand? No. Sorry. <laughs> Mr. Dunlap? Um, so there's, there's a lot of reference to Wildwood's um, current either exploration or decision to sort of gear the the district uh, school improvement plan to its project-based model. Um, 
I know we had talked about eventually Fort River and Wildwood coming back and talking to us about their, their school focus. It seems like, well, perhaps not complete, the, uh, the thematic direction of Wildwood, if, you know, if, if this is reflective of that, is, is pretty strong. Um, is, is there anything we could, we could hear about that at this point and, or, or maybe soon from, from Wildwood? Or? Yeah, so we were planning to have them come back, uh, the schools, both uh, Wildwood and Crocker Farm, come back in April because um, their last session with Dr. Rodriguez is March 18th, I want to say, um, uh, to share where they are. But I, I think th perhaps what's reflected in Mr. Aguirre's document, I want to speak for you, so please come up and feel free to offer a divergent viewpoint, is this has really been consistent with Wildwood has been working on prior to even this current effort. So, for instance, I know Mr. Yaffe attended some professional development uh, last week over the break uh, around leading, you know, project in project-based learning schools. It was a national conference that he attended. Um, this has been uh, an ongoing set of conversations that have occurred at Wildwood. Ron Berger, who some of you may know, is a leader of expedition learning who, who um, works in Amherst and lives in the area, has been there multiple times. So it's really consistent with the flow that's been heading in that direction and really the effort around strategic planning at the elementary level is codifying um, goals and strategies along that dimension. Mr. Move to approve the sabbatical request is submitted. Okay, this motion has been moved. Uh, do we have a second? Second. Thank you. Um, any further comments or questions? Okay, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We look forward to hearing back when you return. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, moving on to the next item. It's uh, dual language enrollment. And I'll encourage Ms. Richardson to come up, and she brought a, a partner slash guest, um, or Louisa, so um, I'll let her do the introductions. But I, I think my framing is just that um, when this was presented last month, there was a lot of feedback on uh, making it more clear, um, more specific, and so I want to compliment, in my opinion, Ms. Richardson um, has, has taken that feedback to heart and done a significant amount of editing to make it uh, both a public-facing document that people can understand, but also one that really lays out more specifically what is involved in the process. So really tonight is more just if there's additional feedback to share with Ms. Richardson after she introduces some of the changes briefly uh, and her, her guest, um, um, who's been supporting us not just in this, but in a, a large number of areas around dual language programming, um, that we're happy to hear them. And um, our meeting is March 6th, um, so that's for all families, but there's certainly going to be a dual language component. So uh, this is a really great opportunity if there's <laughs> less feedback before we share this with the public on that date. Great. Welcome, Ms. Richardson. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Um, so this is Maria Luisa de Stefano, um, and I want to let you introduce yourself. <laughs> she has, she uh, carries a lot of hats, I think, and we're really excited <laughs> to have her supporting this work. So. Um, hi, um, I'm very happy to be here. My name is Maria Luisa Di Stefano. I'm a faculty at University of Massachusetts. Um, I'm, my area of expertise is bilingual education. Um, I'm officially here as a faculty, so a teacher of teachers, um, but also researcher in bilingual education. At the same time, I have to acknowledge that I'm a, um, uh, a mom of uh, three years old, four years old, and maybe in the future could attend the school, so I'm so excited about this project. Um, my daughter is uh, um, trilingual in Italian, Spanish, and English, so um, I would love to hear her in this type of program. Um, I'm also board member of um, MABET, the Malta State Association for Bilingual Education, um, but um, the district has uh, been seeing so good work with the uh, um, um, in pair in, in, uh, in a group team with uh, with the Mabe, and I think that I really I'm proud of them. I'm really doing a great job in uh, planning this new program, um, and I'm also you know an English learner, um, bilingual uh, learner myself. So I try to compare you know my experience as a former teacher and researcher with my personal experience as well. And I'm I'm here to serve. I'm here to support the the, the district in uh, this new uh, exciting project. Great, thank you. So we thought we'd um, have Maria Luisa here to introduce to you all and that she's also done a lot of thinking with us about some of the specifics around enrollment and how do we think about making a program that's really strong in terms of the language background and the balance and um, all of those pieces. And she's also working with us in terms of the UMass courses and some other areas. So. Um, so I guess, I'm trying to remember, I should have brought the older document to compare. There's a lot more here. Um, but a couple of the key things that I think we did change through a lot of conversations 
One was um, laying out four sort of enrollment groups so that you could see where the Fort River zoning impacted the groups and where the language background impacted the groups. Mm -hmm. um, we did, well, let's see what else. Um, just uh, clarified a bunch of things, gave more examples, more numbers. Um, we did, um, Dr. Morris and I discussed having a, um, because we're really aiming to serve our Spanish-speaking and bilingual families, that we would do our best to outreach this spring, but that if we didn't fill the number of seats that we're hoping to, that we would hold some seats through August 1st um, to, in order to fill them um, and maintain more of a wait list so that we could get that language balance that we're hoping for. Um, am I missing anything major? I think the other thing that I remember in the conversation is being really clear on what tool is being used for the lottery and being explicit about that. So, you know, that was laid out to the point of including the actual web link of the tool that we'd plan to use. Not only would it be public, but if people knew what tool we're using. Um, I think that was the thing. I'm thinking of the feedback from last time. I know that we got received some specific feedback around that as well. Yeah. I, I just want to say, uh, just to jump in here, I think, you know, I really appreciate the way you laid out the, the four groups um, and the order upon which they would be, I'm assuming this is in sequential yes. order, that's what the, the chart in the top says, um, the order in which they would be invited to participate. Um, and just to read it out loud for the public, and I yeah. think for anyone who's watching who may not have access to this document, uh, so group one is Fort River zoned Spanish speakers and bilingual students. Uh, group two is Spanish speakers, bilingual students zoned to attend Crocker Farmer Wildwood. Group three is Fort River zoned English speakers. And then group four is English speakers zoned to attend Crocker Farm or Wildwood, which again makes a lot of sense, I think, given the feedback that the committee provided last uh, at the last meeting. I really appreciate that. And then also just to put a fine point on it that um, this document states that on April 29th, a lottery for groups one and two, which is the Spanish speakers across the district, uh, will be held. And then after that point, um, then the groups three and four would come in, right, into into the lottery. So at this point, I'm going to open it up to the committee if there are any questions or comments um, for Ms. Richardson or Dr. Morris. Mr. Nakajima? I was just going to say I really appreciate the, the thoroughness with which we are providing examples, definitions, uh, you know, breaking down the categories. I mean, I think that was certainly a lot of my feedback yeah. last time, and I just think, I think it does. I think it really does answer. I think a lot of what people are going to have is questions when they're saying, "I don't get how this works. Mm -hmm. How do I figure this out?" Um, without just coming to a session or making a phone call, this is now a resource that's going to let people have that really solid starting point. So, thank you very much. Ms. Yeah. <coughs> Pitts, your hand. Mm -hmm. um, just. Kind of nitpicky thing here. I appreciate again all of the um, feedback, but I'm just thinking with group three and four, we're saying Fort River zoned English speakers. Now, what if I'm um, bilingual Chinese English? Um, I think point. we should make sure it's yeah, inclusive, of, mm -hmm. unless um, they you. might think they're automatically mm -hmm. in group one. Yeah, no great point. Um, and otherwise, I think the only other kind of general feedback I have is a question that. I'm still having a little bit, and it isn't really on here, is that since we've shown that these there's like a continuum of English and Spanish speaking, I don't know if we, and we may not want to answer this in a, formally and leave room for us to determine that as we see who applies and who's interested in it, but I think there is going to be some questioning about what makes me a Spanish speaker or a bilingual student to cut, what's the cutoff for these four groups just... Um, it seems like there was a decision not, perhaps, forgive me if I've missed it. No, no, it seems like no. th Correct. there might have been a decision not to include it, and I'm assuming that's to give us right. the room to make that decision as we see who, who's interested. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah, okay. so we do. I mean, we did mention specifically that the group um, for one and two would include Spanish speakers and bilingual families, um, but we do really need to see what the enrollment, um, you know, what the pool is and make those decisions based on what will be the best makeup of the class uh, mm -hmm. and the program. So, yeah. We had a lot of discussion on that very point, so I'm glad yeah. you pointed it out um, in this public meeting because we spent probably more time on that. <laughs> Ms. Richards and I, at least in our conversations, I don't know about yours with others, yes. spent yes, more time on that very others, question yeah. than any anything else in the document that's either listed or not listed. But at the end, you know, we really want to think about 
um, having arranged not just a 50-50, which we talked about the last time, but, you know, with, you know, Maria Lisa and other researchers that we also want to make sure that, you know, out of the students who are identifying as um, Spanish speaker or some, you know, some Spanish background, that we also have some fluent Spanish speakers and then arrange within that because mm -hmm. it's not a, it's not a um, binary system. I'm either bilingual or not, and we want to make sure that that continuum is represented equally across that grouping. And so that's where it gets a little cumbersome to lay that out specifically until you know who the pool of students are. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Dumling? That's a question on the, the sibling priority enrollment rule. So one potential issue I can imagine being asked is, so say your first child gets in in group two, um, and then you have a younger child coming in. If, if the Spanish speakers from Fort River fill up that year, then your older child, oh, I'm sorry, your younger child will not get into the program. And so the same thing with, if your first, if your first child gets into group four, and then the English speakers fill up at Fort River, then you're not, your other child isn't getting in. It seems like, I'm, I'm trying to think of it just from the, I'm thinking out loud here, because yeah. it's a complicated question um, of, I think, I think if I was a parent and I was really excited about this program, I would have a real hard time making that commitment, and we want people to stay in the program, right? Um, knowing that there was a some X percent of chance, and if the program's really successful, then, you know, kids at Fort River are going to want to do it, that you know, a, ch a chance, maybe even a probability that I'll, I'm going to have a two-zone family, which might not be tenable, and so I, I don't know how you've maybe sort of thought of that. I mean, I'm just thinking about this through this round. Dr. Morris? Yeah, so I think for zone two, uh, just based on the size of the catchment area, I'm not um, so concerned about that because it'd be, it'd be unless, it, and if demographic change, we'll have to revisit it, but it'd be unusual to have 20 Fort River zone Spanish speaker bilingual students. So if you're at the top of zone two, you're, you're going to get into the program. Just mathematically, it's just, it's hard to imagine with our current demographics that that would be an issue. For Zone 4, we had a lot of conversations about that. I think that is a more realistic scenario where it could create a two-school option. And for us at the current moment, we want to prioritize having uh, the greatest number of Spanish-speaking students in the program. Mm -hmm. And it was hard to prioritize a English-speaking student who doesn't live in the Fort River catchment area over a Fort River... Uh, is an English-speaking student who doesn't live in the Fort River catchment area over a an English-speaking student who does live in that, who lives across the street. So that was really the conversation zone two. I don't think it's an issue, but I think that was where we we struggled, you know, to about zones three and four and how to prioritize that. I'm not saying that as clearly as I'd like. I don't know if Ms. Richardson. No, I yeah. think, did that make sense? Yeah, okay. <laughs> it it made sense to me, okay. but I, yeah. I'm thinking about it a lot. So yeah. um, the other piece that I would say is that we on the front end, we're going to have that issue with families splitting schools as well. So that's something we have to think about regardless, I think. Um, you know, in talking to some families who have kids at Crawford Farm or at Wildwood already, we're saying to them, hey, we think this is a great opportunity. Would you be interested in having your, you know, your kids come to the Fort River Dual Language Program? That's a challenge we have to think about for them. Um, some families I've talked to have said, as long as you're going to get the kids there, you're going to provide the transportation, that's fine. I'm excited about the program, right? Others won't feel that way. They'll feel like it is too much of a split. So, um, but just thinking about how do we support families who are in that situation, I think, is going to happen as we start to recruit in general. So. You know, yeah. one thing that I, I think uh, might be helpful, just, I was looking at the enrollment team paragraph here, which describes the role of this uh, group, which would be convened to review applications and make enrollment determinations. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it's helpful to include here, or whatever document ends up becoming the public-facing document, if it's not this, mm -hmm. that uh, there will be periodic review, right, maybe an annual review mm -hmm. of how this is working out for families. Um, there, right? I didn't see that... Uh, well, I mean, I think at least where, where people's eyes will be trained to go looking for information specifically around enrollment. Yeah. Um, I think we talked about it, but it's I don't... Right it's right here. So it's, it's under the feedback section. It says all families will, um, who participate in the lottery oh, there will be is. surveyed about their experience. Uh, based on this feedback as well as feedback. Well, that's not staff. exactly what I'm saying. So I think that, yeah, I think that... Uh, so adding there, maybe? Saying, well, perhaps. I mean, I would actually... 
I would strongly consider adding it in, into the place again where people oh, in would the in the enrollment section. team section, oh, you know, um, and possibly even sooner. I think where Will siblings have you might even repeat it a couple of different times, and only because again, whatever becomes a public facing document, that's what people will be referencing mm -hmm. when they're looking for information yeah. to help decide whether or not they want to participate in the program. You know, mm -hmm. so to say something along the lines of having the school committee and the superintendent and the enrollment team, whatever formula it is, review this on an annual basis to you know understand whether or not this is working perhaps may not necessarily address exactly what mr dumling is raising which is a, a problem uh but at least you know can help people understand well maybe they'll think of differently about this or there's a place for us to go if mm -hmm. we're really concerned about this and we want to advocate on behalf of our family or something yeah dr morris i think the other thing i wish i'd said at the beginning when mr dumling had first asked the question is um some of the sibling piece came from a direct experience of districts mm -hmm. so when we were in harrisonburg for instance they were like be wary of sibling policies um because really it eliminates the option for many families because you have enough siblings just with the families that will be in, there's enough siblings where actually you just get a, a small number of families who are populating the program, and it doesn't actually have the reach that you'd want it to have. Um, and also they felt like in many communities, and there's a lot of other communities that have faced this, it actually starts deteriorating the balance you want between Spanish-speaking students and English-speaking students. Uh, Atlantic had a big article about this last year about, um, oh, I'm going to forget the title of it, but it was essentially that dual language programs are a commodity and they're being hoarded by certain demographics that, that sometimes shift the intent of the program. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're, some of this yeah. is based literally on feedback, and Mabe, I know, um, mm -hmm. has also um, shared some cautions with us about that. And for me, the viewpoint of for English speaking students is that um, to be in this program is a huge benefit, um, and we want to expend it as, uh, you know, share that benefit as readily as we can, but I think keeping it more open um, has some benefits as well. So that w that's our perspective anyway. Okay. Mr. Dunley? Yeah, so I, I think just the last comment I would make on the issue really briefly is that, so it, it's actually something that we don't, is not going to be in play this year because we right. don't have anybody in the <laughs> right. language program right now. Right. So we actually do have a year right. to, to actively have this conversation. And I, I would encourage us to because, I mean, the, the particular issue we're talking about with regards to English speakers in Fort River versus English speakers outside of Fort River and who gets prioritized within that group, that doesn't affect the balance issue that you right. just talked about. Right. Uh, and, and when we say, talk, you know, Fort River kids across the street, I mean, most Fort River kids, kids who go to Fort River don't live across the street. The, our enrollment zones are all over the place. Um, so I, I just think it's, it's, it's an active discussion mm -hmm. that, um, that now that we've identified it as one of the more complex issues, yeah. that thankfully we don't have to have solidified in a couple weeks, yeah. <laughs> right. we can continue to have the active discussion. Mm -hmm. and Let's bring it back. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, great. Any other questions or comments for Ms. Richardson or Dr. Morris on this topic? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Incredible work. I don't know Thank you. also if it's worth mentioning, just uh, you've asked for some info on outreach events, mm -hmm. um, and I can say that we have a bunch coming up in March. So there is the kindergarten event that's district wide, but we also have some specific events happening in different areas of the district um, that are reaching out to different communities. I wonder if you could share that with the school committee, perhaps with Ms. Westmoreland, um, and that sure. way we can help promote it as well. Sure. Okay, yeah, great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for joining us. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is math report uh, grade six. And we had a little bit of a preview of this at the regional school committee last night. Just a smidge. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little tiny bit. So, um, and I'll keep this brief. I mean, I think this is a conversation clearly we're going to have to come back to with a larger conversation about mathematics. The reason that I asked the chair to have this added is, you know, that conversation was very region centric. Um, and it really wasn't around the recommendation that was made by math consultants about where the sixth graders are educated. I mean, I think that will come back to naturally probably in April once another facility study is done. Um, you know, and I'm not foreshadowing what we should do about that, but I think there's a natural place for that conversation. It's more just to say that we noted that there was a recommendation to change the math curriculum in sixth grade that was made um, and really to align our programming six through 12. And it's a sort of with our current structure, gov uh, governance structure, it's a bit of an awkward conversation because sixth grades are located, at least in districts I govern, across four schools and two districts that are, you know, not necessarily formally connected to the 7 through 12 model. 
Um, but the way that we, we viewed this, the way the consultants did the work, we asked them not to come back twice. We were, you know, there wasn't a reasonable expectation is that, you know, the work that would be continuing would be 6 through 12, so that our 6th grade teachers would be actively engaged in that work. Um, there were some conversations specifically about um, perhaps having fewer 6th grade teachers teach mathematics, so they could be a little more specialization with 6th um, grade teachers with more bath background in mathematics instruction, and we're actively looking <coughs> about models. Um, it'd be a little easier if we had classes Having three classes in the sixth grade makes that, or two actually, makes that quite complicated of how mm -hmm. to pull that off. Um, but we are actively having those conversations. You know, for me, I'd like to bring this back. I just wanted, I didn't want to have this big report that referenced sixth grade one night and the next night not have any. And I'm, I'm open to any questions about it, but it was more just wanting to say at an Amherst school committee meeting that there was a recommendation made by math consultants that um, to look at our sixth grade curriculum and scope and sequence and to further align with the regional schools. I feel like this is a really, really big topic. It is, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And I'm looking at how much time is look, you know, given for it. So yeah, and I, and I appreciate uh, the superintendent bringing this to the committee's attention. I think more formally um, and putting it on the agenda. I do think that this is probably something that we want to bring back uh, in a more substantive yeah. way, with perhaps you know even some initial thoughts back from you, um, yeah. you know, and also from the principals and other educators. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I would, I would uh, definitely entertain any initial thoughts or reactions or directions along those lines from the committee, you know, but I don't think it makes a lot of sense for us to dive deep into to this conversation right now. Um, but I, I do think, you know, maybe thinking about our agendas and the next couple of months, how we might be able to bring this piece in more substantively yeah. uh, would make a lot of sense. So I agree, and I think the other thing, the reason, the other reason I wanted to have it on here tonight is that I referenced this report in the budget. Mm -hmm. So just to be really clear of, like, why are you just doing this, like, 90-second, you know, um, conversation, that, you know, there were some budget implications both, you know, in the curriculum material side but also on the, on the staffing side that um, I felt would be really awkward if I didn't say what I said. And, and I'm open to any questions. I agree with the chair's perspective that we want to do a more deep dive with Mr. Sheehan's back, and, uh, and, and we can do that. But it, it just it felt weird not to at least have this as a placeholder. Sure. Mr. Nakajima? No, I was just going to say, I, um, I would like urge us not to go too deep on this, um, just because it, it, you're like opening Pandora's box <laughs> in terms of all the implications that run from mm -hmm. how you're staffing math instruction in our elementary schools and what the curriculum is on to moving sixth grade to the middle school, right? I mean, it goes, runs the gamut, and this could open up an awful lot. I would much rather have you bring back a structured conversation mm -hmm. on this topic yeah. that's organized where you've also had an opportunity to have outreach to all the staff yeah. so that there's input, and this feels really well integrated and organic and not something where we're just winging out there with... Yeah. Um, whether they're wonderful ideas or not, ideas that could feel really disruptive to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So um, I think just from a moment, like a, so staying on, staying on the theme of meta structure agenda kind of things. I think I think the um, usefulness of having a, a joint meeting with the region is going to be helpful in this regard because it, from the region meeting, it sounded like um, some of these suggestions could happen fairly quickly, and if that happens. There was an emphasis on aligning six to eight, and and we, we only go up to six on this committee. <laughs> and so if we're talking about aligning six to eight, then we have to be talking with the region at the same time. Um, so I, th I think that, that the urgency of that ratch ratchets up a few notches, um, and then the need to just make sure that we've discussed it thoroughly enough to, to hit whatever implementation um, schedule is going to be necessary. And th just just in general, the, the, uh, the, the notion of recommending moving six to the middle school sort of came out of left field in that. <laughs> um, so that, again, is something we've only ever heard from the building project standpoint, but that sort of ratchets up that conversation a little bit as well. So. Yeah, I, I, I would agree that it, I think it ratchets up uh, in terms of um, just attention, right? Uh, I, I still would urge... Uh, I guess this committee and, and the superintendent to to make sure that when we bite into the apple, that yeah. we actually are biting into something that is fully thought through and or at least, you know, vetted internally in the district among all the folks who really matter, and to really start thinking through what what some of those implications would be, and then bring that back to the committee. Um, and maybe it's a joint meeting with the region, 
you know, we can certainly talk with our chair uh, to figure that out. But it seems like at that point, then we have something substantive to really discuss, you know, and, and, and make happen. Ms. McDonald? I, I would second the, the request for a joint meeting, because mm -hmm. I sort of building on your observation, Dr. Morris, earlier about that we have all these long meetings because we have two separate structures, and this is one topic, and we shouldn't have mm -hmm. separate conversations about it, particularly if you know, we're going to be hampered and not talking about sixth grade when the recommendation clearly does include sixth grade. So I would strongly mm -hmm. advocate for having a joint meeting to um, when Mr. Sheehan comes back with his mm -hmm. yeah. fuller. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next item on the agenda is MSBA statement of interest process, which has been uh, taking over quite a bit of time. <laughs> <laughs> community and this committee for some time now, for a few weeks. Um, I just very quickly, before we, we jump in, I just want to say we are, uh, we've already scheduled the listening sessions for folks who may just be tuning in. Uh, we have uh, two sessions scheduled tomorrow, uh, the 27th. We have two more scheduled on Thursday, the 28th. And then we have two more scheduled on March 6th next week uh, with a possible snow date of March 7th. Um, and so hopefully uh, we will get good attendance there. I think the town council has been doing a really good job of, of uh, you know, helping to turn some cons constituents out. Uh, we've heard from, or I've heard anyway, from the town council president that all town council members will be attending at least a couple of the sessions. Many of them will be here, <coughs> many of them, which is great. I know this committee also will be in attendance. Um, we have purposefully uh, not posted these meetings uh, as actual official school committee meetings or town council meetings because we are there mostly to listen. Uh, so we will be there in listening form. Uh, we have a facilitator who will be you know, managing the conversations. He will introduce all of us. He will introduce town council as well. Um, but there will be no formal speaking role for us, and so I think that that's actually a good thing. Um, we will probably all be, depending on how many of us are at each of these sessions, be sort of splintered off and, and into the different group discussions, so we can actually dive in and hear what people are saying um, and participate in those conversations, you know, sort of one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so, you know, I, I'm looking forward to it. I think hopefully the weather's not too bad tomorrow. We're looking at a few are, inches of snow. We are on for tomorrow night if there's any questions. We are on for tomorrow night, yes. Mr. Sullivan, who was here earlier, assured me that we would be fine. It's light, fluffy <laughs> snow that's going. <laughs> yeah. If the Shootsbury yes. DPW person says we're fine, then I think we're fine. Excellent. Yes. That's, that's good to hear, yes. Yeah. What I've been saying to people is there are no hazardous conditions so far, so hopefully that's true. <laughs> Mr. Nakajima? I'm just going to, um, I know this is obvious, but I was just going to emphasize that not only do we not have a formal role, but I know we all know this, but we legally cannot offer our opinions. Like, we are legally prescribed from doing so exactly. under pain of the Attorney General telling us we've done a bad thing. <laughs> so, I know we have no formal role, but we have no informal role either. We have no informal role, <laughs> formal Actually, role. If you know what I mean. Like, no don't, role, like no matter what somebody says and how much you want to stand up and say something, don't do it. Yeah. It's against the law. Yeah. So just building on that, because when you say participate, it's participate by active listening. By active listening, that's right. <laughs> Although we did, we did yeah. say before that if, if there's a direct question uh, made to you know to one of us that we can answer, um, and and that's okay. But we should not deliberate. We should not expand on it. We should not share our opinions. It is literally just a you know factual response to a question that's been posed to us. And if it feels like something that is too big. Uh, we can say to that, to that person, please bring it to a school committee meeting. Uh, we will have a discussion around this, and we will be capturing all of those questions. Uh, so the facilitators actually have a group of people that will be there writing down all of the questions that we hear, and so those will be reported back to us um, for us to respond to however we want to in public meetings. Yeah. Dr. Morris, is there anything else that you want to add at this time? For I just oh, had sure. one um, so I know we've ha talked about this before, but there's at least um, one district, I don't know if others, that have been advertising the Crocker Farm in particular event as a district meeting um, at the same start time as as the listening session. So, and I've, I've just seen sort of exchanges about, well, I'll be there late, and uh, so 
I think we need to be prepared that people are going to be walking in expecting that it's a district meeting at some point and because it's it's not being labeled as a listening session for the schools. Well, that's unfortunate. I think uh, I had a very clear conversation with the town council president who did share that with district councilors that these are not district council meetings, that they were welcome to have a district council meeting at the same on the same day, mm -hmm. either before or after, but these are school committee meetings for the perp or you know for the purpose of these listening sessions. Um, one thing we can definitely do is make sure the facilitator reminds people of that. Uh, so even though unfortunately these may have been advertised, you know, differently, uh, we can certainly have a facilitator remind people that this is not, these are not district meetings. So no other topics will be discussed and also the district counselors don't have a role there at all. <laughs> Great. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so. I think that was that was pretty much it. We just wanted to bring everyone up to speed, and, and if there's any questions or comments, Dr. Morris. Is yeah, I think the only thing I'll note, um, and I think I've mentioned this before, but I'm able to attend about half of the sessions. There's other <coughs> work commitments, like visiting Leverett on you know Thursday night and things like that. But but again, to miss it, the chair's point, you know, you know, while I'm not bound in the same way that you know elected officials are bound in terms of open meeting law, I still see my role as pretty identical to what. Mr. Sardona has shared that I can, if there's a factual question that's a clear factual question, I'll give a clear factual answer. If it's an opinion question, that's really not the purpose, it's really to listen. Yeah, and we don't want really, you know, I think that I've talked a lot with the facilitator, um, you know, his recommendation and the experience that he has in, in meeting these kinds of conversations is that we don't want to get caught up in a discussion around, you know, a, a question being posed and then people getting drawn into what they believe or what they don't believe or any of that. Um, and he's actually, I think, very confident that um, he can manage that kind of conversation. So I'm just thinking specifically about yeah. you yeah. coming into the, those sessions, that there may be an expectation from some that are in attendance that you should be answering all the Sorry. questions that are being posed. Um, and that's really not what these sessions are about. So he and his uh, you know, work partner will be very clear about how you know, that these sessions are, are really just to capture those comments and questions. Uh, and that, again, you may answer some very simple factual questions, but that we're not going to get pulled into a long, drawn-out uh, presentation. Great. Great. Okay, thank you. So the next item on the agenda is the regionalization update. Uh, so, Mr. Dumbling, I'm going to look to you. Yes. <laughs> So You've been very busy as well. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So regionalization for all those who are watching for the first time and entering this topic, I'll give my standard 20-second introduction, which is we are a pre-K to 6 district in Amherst. That's a pre-K to 6 district in Pelham. And the basic question is, should we merge these two districts into one? Is that educationally and financially advisable for both towns? That's what our board is exploring. I think that's, that's the shortest I've ever done that. So that's, <laughs> that's, the, that's what we're doing. So uh, update on that. So our public outreach continues as we're uh, working our way through uh, the detailed uh, issues and such. So I'm, I'm actually giving a talk tomorrow at noon at the Bank Center. Um, the, the League of Women Voters has invited us to, so that's thank you very much, the excellent League of Women Voters. Um, uh, Stan has invited us to um, appear on his byline episode. So uh, Emily Marriott, who's the vice chair and representative from Pelham, and myself will be recording that next week, and that will be out sometime at the end of the end of the month. So. You looked like you had a good time on that the other day, the other week. You so, know, Mr. Rosenberg is is an absolute delight uh, <laughs> and a really great interviewer. Um, and so, I, I'm really glad this show exists now that Amherst Media put this together, uh, and that we have this resource in our community. Mm -hmm. So, so that's one. Um, two is um, we got a fairly substantive update from our financial consultant uh, last week, and we are uh, continuing to review. So, this Friday morning is our next meeting. We're reviewing. The results there. So I can give you a brief update on that. Um, but before I do, the the, the, last, the before I, I don't want to forget, um, we're trying to schedule a two towns meeting. So essentially, getting the select board, finance committee, and school committee from Pelham, and the town council, school committee, and yes, those two um, from Amherst uh, together Saturday morning in the tradition in the logistical tradition of the four towns meeting, um, so that we basically present uh, our work to date so far. So more than an intro, saying okay, this is where we've got so far for pros and cons on school committee composition on the financial modeling this is you know the sort of completed exploration of that um, because there's a, a wealth of experience and knowledge um, of people who are serving on these boards and we want to make sure that before we uh, present to the public and then make a recommendation uh, that we leave no stone unturned um, that's obviously a huge logistical scheduling challenge um, that I reached out to the chairs 
including Mr. Donias about that. Um, I just want to get a sense from this committee about sort of timing. So we were looking at, I had proposed anywhere from uh, mid-March to mid-April, and the initial feedback I got from chairs was that closer to mid-April would be much preferable. Um, I'm seeing nodding heads, is that? <laughs> okay, so we're, we're talking about the scheduling this Friday, so we'll try and shore that up. But that was, that was my sense from other chairs, and it looks like given everything else that's going on, that would be good. Um, Thank you. So, so the thumbnail sketch on the finance, uh, financial analysis, so without giving you the whole blow-by-blow blow of all the details and spreadsheets, uh, just to bring you up to speed on that, I'd, I'd given a brief update before where our financial consultant had basically modeled uh, an assessment method of what would the savings be in the first fiscal year for Amherst and what would they be from Pelham. And using the sort of standard issue vanilla model that most districts use, which is um, essentially a five-year enrollment with or without some adjustment for transportation, um, it didn't show any savings for Amherst, um, and it showed all the savings for uh, for Pelham. And so uh, our basic question is, is there an assessment method that's um, that will produce savings for both towns um, that's also explainable and um, reliable going forward? Um, and so the second iteration of that, uh, our consultant went back and looked at um, lots of different, over 100 different combinations of weighted variables uh, of, uh, of how you could potentially get to savings. and. Um, we did get to one that had a weighted um, percentage of median income and five-year enrollment. Uh, the board felt that, that was, it was so complicated to derive that, that it wasn't justifiably explainable in any sense. You know, the only real common sense explanation we could get to if someone asked us is, well, we, we did that so that we get <laughs> to our savings. There was no real um, uh, you know, originating you know, justification for that. And so. Uh, we, we went through a third exercise that was presented, presented last Wednesday, we were discussing on, on Thursday, which is to start with your enrollment and then uh, he used a fact, factor called enrollment shares. And this is after starting, so the first year is uh, assessment by agreement, which is essentially we just agree that we split the savings. So that's how you establish your first year budget. And then whatever increases come on the next year budget, you then use the assessment formula for that. So you sort of initiate the, the assessment uh, and then go for it forward. Um, using that method just with enrollment shares, it's simpler and it does produce the savings for both towns in the first year. Um, it seemed quite sensitive to small changes in the next year, so we looked at FY21 if making some assumptions, right, about the increase in the budget and how many students from uh, Pelham and how many students from Amherst change. Uh, and it, it varied the, the savings quite significantly. Um, and the combined savings here is, is not a tremendous amount. So the between uh, if you add up in the first year the transportation savings at 70% reimbursement, which is a projection, uh, and the bonus aid, it's um, $428,000. Uh, and if you take the bonus aid away, it's about $375,000. So there's, there's not a tremendous amount of wiggle room um, for that to be um, split and allocated and, and to change over time and still produce savings, right? And so that's, um, so we're talking about that on Friday, um, seeing what, what we want to do for that. Um, that this, was, this has been really sort of the key example that we've really dug into and said, we want to make sure that we exhaust every avenue here and that we present to and get feedback from finance and select and school boards um, about their thoughts on the matter, people who have spent years thinking about these kinds of problems. Um, so I hope that's relatively clear. Any, any questions on, on where we're at with that? Ms. Fitzgerald? Uh, just a clarifying question. Um, when you're talking about savings, I'm assuming it's about the operating budget and not, you didn't look at all at potential capital costs or savings. I mean. Right. So the, uh, when we talk about the assessment method, we're talking about operational savings. Yeah. But right. so, it, the, so the, I guess I was trying to understand so this conversation about savings is really just to get to a good, proper assessment method. It's not to kind of create a cost benefit analysis in terms of whether or not we should adopt regionalization. It's more about just figuring out what type of assessment method you'd use were we to get to. So this particular subtopic is just about the assessment method, this modeling that we're going through with our financial consultant. More broadly, though, we're definitely looking at mm -hmm. is it cost benefit analysis. And one of the factors in that, I think I mentioned before, um, the MSBA gives you an extra 6% reimbursement on uh, new building projects if you're forming a new region. So that's one consideration. Um, one factor in potential savings. We also, um, we, we talked to the superintendent and the finance director about is there any cost savings from having one district, um, given, given that we're already so joined in, with Union 26 that we already mm -hmm. share services, um, you know, we essentially concluded that no, there's no real cost savings from, from sharing 
the services without Union 26, just in one district. Uh, but so, yeah, to, so the short answer to your question is yes, we are looking at the broader question. Okay. Is it, you know, what's the broad cost benefit analysis? And I assume that the two towns meeting, uh, this will be covered, right? Uh, sort of in some sort of presentation? Yes, yeah. So, so my, you know, my t intention is to, is to not do just a 101 level intro, because I think most people on these boards have that already. Uh, and yet we don't want to say, okay, we're done, we've decided, you know, here's our conclusion. We want to say, well, he, we've, we've explored these branches, because there's really only a half a dozen or so major issues, but these are very long branches, and say, okay, we've explored them, here's the pros, cons, and what we've, we've come to. What do you think? What's your feedback? What's, what are, are there things that we're not looking at? Are we crazy to be continuing to explore this particular branch? You know, before we go to the public and then present this quite complicated topic, you know, what's, what's your sense and take? Because um, we were going to have to do that anyway. It's just it's just going to be easier to get everybody in the same room as opposed to doing six meetings over the course of you know, two or three months. I think it's a good idea. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I would recommend uh, having, you know, a brief presentation that definitely doesn't make too many assumptions but is not too weedy either, you know. So it's, mm -hmm. it's really just about the highlights of the questions that you've been trying to answer. Uh, I would also encourage there to be, you know, split time between the Pelham representatives and the, you know, Amherst representatives on this uh, committee. Uh, just politically, I think it's a smart move if you're going to be presenting to the t two towns to have, you know, folks from both sides or both towns represented. Um, and to have those voices there pretty clearly. Um, but I, I do recommend also that, you know, before the two towns that there be materials shared with the committees. Um, so that we have some time to peruse some mm -hmm. of that, you know, and bring the best kind of feedback we can bring to right. the meeting. <laughs> Mr. Nakajima? Yeah, I guess the only thing I've had is um, uh, if there are any, I don't, I don't know how you've been organizing the work, if there are any assumptions that you've made going into it um, that are sort of ground rules for your conversation, and I'm just going to throw some out. Like a ground rule is Pelham Elementary School is a functioning elementary school, will exist in perpetuity after the regionalization occurs, and there's been no, uh, a la what Ms. Pister said, if you're scenario, scenario planning around facilities and operating, you, you either are or you're not modeling, um, like eliminating Pelham Elm is one of your one of your objectives, and creating operational cost savings. I mean, I'm making that up because mm -hmm. you'd say eliminate yeah. Fort River. I'm right, gonna right. put an addition on mm -hmm. Pelham. But I'm just saying, either you're going radical. In other words, the real point I'm getting at is either you're going like you know every concept's open, sort of a radical evaluation of how do you get cost savings, or in fact you've made which some could be very reasonable. Um, ground rules at the beginning saying, look, we're only entertaining this. I mean, Pelham said, and I'm not trying to pick on them, Pelham said at the beginning as a ground rule, we're only entertaining this conversation if we assume that for the most part Pelham Elm stays intact as a functioning thing. Now, you either made that assumption or you didn't make that assumption. I just think you should be transparent about any of those things mm -hmm. so that A, we know them going in, and B, we, I don't know, don't end up arguing about it unless we have to. Or, <laughs> Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. That was a great update. Uh, okay, next item on the agenda is Fort River Feasibility Update. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Yeah, or? so, yeah, that, yes. and uh, if you have anything to throw. Yeah, I have a little thing again. So, so the, uh, the, the work continues to um, get to a um, final feasibility study document. There was a, a public session that was... Um, uh, on February 13th mm -hmm. at the middle school uh, that was um, you know, moderately attended and had a bunch of questions. There's a presentation from the, from the design uh, team and uh, a lot of, I think the bulk of the questions that came up were around um, how you make assumptions uh, or, and how you model uh, a zero energy building and then how do you understand site conditions and how do you explain site conditions and how do they affect the feasibility of buildings? I think those are the basic, not exclusive, but the basic categories of issues that came up. Um, there's going to be another, that was in the evening, there's going to be another daytime session on March 4th um, at noon, noon uh, in Town Hall. Mm -hmm. In Town Hall. Uh, in which there's going to be an identical presentation and just 
taking notes from people for whoever shows up. Um, as, as to the best of my knowledge, those are the only public sessions we're going to have to get feedback on what should be included in the draft. Um, there, there is also going to be put to bid a uh, independent cost estimator to evaluate the cost estimates from the first cost estimator. Um, since the first cost estimator was a sub to the designer, there's language in the warrant article that was approved by town meeting that suggested that there would be an independent cost estimator for it. Um, that should improve at least the quality of the estimates that come out of it, the final study. Um, <coughs> Are we concerned about the quality that has been done so far? No. I mean, I'm not, I mean, well, sorry, I'm giving you my answer. I think the committee is the committee, the committee would look forward to getting another set of eyes on it. Honestly, most of the, most of the variable, potential variability in cost estimates isn't going to come from whether or not the cost estimator did a good job or not. It's what the inputs go in. So I'll give you an example of two examples. Um, based on the geotechnical analysis that was done, the, um, the designer originally assumed they might have to put pilings uh, down into the ground for a foundation on the site because of its general wetness. Um, think, and this is really stupid, but if you know Boston, think Back Bay, right? It's all on pilings. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, they, and now they don't think they need it. So for the, if, they're, if you did a new construction of a two-story addition, you'd have to do some site mitigation around the wetness, but you wouldn't need to do the pilings. So since that was an assumption going into the original cost estimate, that meant the new building, new construction estimate, was higher than it otherwise would be because it had included that. On the other side of it, um, the, uh, the designers did not include any mitigation to the um, floor or structure of the existing buildings in the renovation, partial demo reno um, concepts that they had. And coming out of the geotechnical survey, They've now said that they think, uh, you might know what this is, I'm going to butcher it, but there's something you apparently, you drill holes and you inject some sort of substance into the, into the ground mm. that then solidifies and stabilizes it. Um, and uh, they now need to do that. So that wasn't included in the cost estimate either. And so it's not like it's a bad estimate, it's more a matter of some of those things need to be revised. Um, obviously, if there's other things that come back that are different, they'll come back. There's the goal is still to get this report done by the end of April. Um, in that regard, one of the questions that the committee had, the feasibility committee had, was whether the school committee here, um, the obligation of the, of the feasibility for the feasibility committee is to come back with the final report and the like, presentation from the designers. Um, the question is, do you want a preview of the draft before it becomes final, or you have an opportunity to give feedback, or do you want it at the end when the thing's done? And I mean, in, in, a, in an actual committee meeting, because obviously you're all free to attend, and if the chair said you wanted to read a draft, I would make sure you had a draft, <laughs> or any other member. I mean, I, I could tell you, I think for my preference, I would rather have a final, uh, because I think that once we have any early drafts, that's what becomes public information and public knowledge that gets shared out. Um, I'd rather have, you know, as, as close to perfect as we can be the public document that everyone starts working from. But I don't know if the committee has different thoughts or opinions on that. No? Okay. Okay. <laughs> I will take that silence as strong guidance, strong and <laughs> strong assertive guidance yes. from the school committee. Uh, I think so. I, my my only question, though, about having the uh, second round of cost estimators mm -hmm. is that adding cost to the feasibility study that was originally. No, it was in the budget. Originally. It was in the budget. Okay. Yeah, it was in the budget. Okay. Great. Dr. Morris. Yep. My only addition to what was shared by Dr. Dunk by Mr. Nakajima was that uh, this early this afternoon um, I did a window into ARPS with Richard who is who is here who is the lead designer and Jonathan Salvin who's the chair of the feasibility committee I, I thought it worked uh, I thought it was an excellent I'm not, I didn't have a large role in it but I just thought it really clarified um, for people who are wondering what's the connection to a future MSBA project 
what's the value in doing this work, I really think um, both both Jonathan and Richard clarified in, in really close detail uh, what the work was that happened and how it could then influence future work in the district. And, you know, I was mostly in the role of interviewer, but because I had the dual role, I, I jumped in and, and shared some of my thoughts as well. So that'll be available next week. I'm not so. embar too embarrassed to say, is there anything I just said that was wrong based on what no, you today? No, not at all. <laughs> um, I don't think I'm okay with that if I was. I would want you to correct me. I think the only thing that I heard from Richard, which would you know, be on TV next week, is yeah. that he, he believes they'll be able to finish the report by the end of next month. Great. So by the end of March. Oh, cool. the end of April. Awesome. And, um, but, um, but other than that, it was spot on. But I, I, I think it really, for some of the questions that I know you've been getting as committee members and I've been getting as superintendent, um, I really think it's a good 28 minutes uh, for viewing. And, you know, Richard shares some of the images that you've all seen, but I think also provides a context of how this would be useful no matter what process moves on, you know, from here, you know, because he's aware of the statement of interest process, he's aware of the listening sessions, and aware of what I've proposed. I, mean, I haven't engaged him, but he's just, you know, aware. And, you know, he was able to speak to, you know, what are the implications of, and how could this data be used um, in the future, you know, whatever route we go. So I, I thought it was really helpful. Great. Thank could you, you. Can you send us a link when that's live? I think it's unavailable. Because I think yeah. I mean, I would like to, I guess I'll watch it and make sure I agree with you. But it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's helpful. I would actually love to push it out for people to see it then. That'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. That was the goal that, that the three of us had um, when designing, you know, because we collaboratively write questions, is, is really to show the value in it. And I, again, I'm self interested in this, but I really think it, it came through that Richard and Jonathan were really clear with their responses. And um, I will absolutely share it with you. Great. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Nakajima, for the update. Okay. That was really good. Um, okay, so uh, we have accept gifts. We have one gift, it looks like. We do. In the back of our packets. So I will take a motion if anyone wants to read the gift. And Ms. McDonald? I move that we accept the gift from the Fort River Parent Council number 2015 to support the Fort River for Art program in the amount of $100. Great. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor? <coughs> Great. Thank you very much. Thank you to the Fort River Parent Council. Uh, school committee planning. So we have a meeting Monday, March 4th, uh, which is uh, six days from now, um, primarily to talk about the statement of interest and review the uh, feedback, uh, listening sessions, excuse me. We first also, round, anyway. First round, yeah, because mm -hmm. four of the six will be completed. Thank you. Uh, we also have just one minor topic. We talked about a grant we got from DESE in collaboration with the Holyoke Public Schools around dual language programming, and because it's a collaboration, our attorneys feel like it'd be a good thing for there to be a formal vote of the school committee to accept it, because it's, it's the grant that we're, it's coming directly to us, but we're actually owning it for both districts, and that was the advice, so we'll bring it next week. And then we have to work on a date, whether it's March 11th or whether it's a topic that perhaps precedes a regional meeting. I'm saying this out loud. I have not talked to the regional chair because he's in a role as an Amherst School Committee member right now, right? Um, I'm not here. Um, <laughs> about um, a formal vote on um, a statement of interest um, to move a statement of interest forward. So those are the two kind of very specific meetings. Mm -hmm. Our next more traditional meeting is March 19th. I have um, final budget vote, school choice vote, and actually I did have Crocker Farm Wildwood Strategic Planning because that actually is after mm -hmm. the last session with Dr. Rodriguez, so I misspoke earlier when I said it was in April. Those were the three primary topics I had. And uh, the ADA audit, do we want to talk about that? Um, is that I'll, coming back next month? Yeah, I'm thinking the last session <coughs> I'm going to put it on as a placeholder. I got to work with with um, okay. with the consultants about their timeline. I think it's possible to do that on the 19th, but it depends how what the feedback they get and how quickly they can. Okay. I can do a process update regardless. We can talk about that later. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea, though. And then we were also going to talk about just uh, some uh, basic parameters for school committee meetings, just yeah. timing and all that kind of stuff. So a couple of other hands, Ms. McDonald. Um, so I didn't have a meeting on my calendar for Monday. Is that yeah, Monday, March 4th at 6 p.m. It is. I thought that went out, but maybe not. I think the, the draft went out. So these are the meetings that were um, Dr. Morris had announced at, during the PowerPoint presentations around this, the okay. SBA process. So they weren't previous to that, but in early January they were scheduled. Okay. So we'll need to reschedule the policy yes. subcommittee. <laughs> at least you're free. 
<laughs> That's a better response than I was concerned about it two seconds ago. So, yeah. Mr. Dumbling? Um, meeting location, I thought we could uh, follow up on because we never made a sort of a choice. I was going to bring that up at the tail end of all of this, but you, we can talk about it now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, sure. Yeah. Um, so I think you know we just wanted to. I, I just wanted to check in with the committee and see, you know, any reactions to having our meeting at town hall. I think that was a difficult meeting because it was such a long meeting. Um, so hopefully we can separate those two things mm -hmm. because the two are not necessarily part and parcel, but just in general environment, uh, what was your feeling being there? And do we want to do it again? Ms. McDonald and Ms. Um, I actually liked the layout much better. I, I could see everybody's faces yeah, without having to lean forward <laughs> or lean back, and because we were parked sort of at that corner, so I just found it weirdly more intimate than mm -hmm. than this um, environment for having conversations as a as a group um, and um, the chairs were more comfortable <laughs> that's not a reason to move <laughs> mr. Dumley uh, I thought it was a good length of meeting to put it through its paces I mean, we, got, <laughs> we got a good taste of what it would that's be like true. yeah right um, I mean so, and, and so other than uh, I might have to go to microphone class for a couple weeks <laughs> you know to work that little button um, yeah, I, I liked it a lot more than I, th I thought it. I thought I would, and I actually got a chance to watch um, another meeting um, on, on the the live. Mm -hmm. the, so the streaming and the video quality there is much better. It's much improved. And so just in terms of like being out there for the community to ease, it, it's you know transparency is really about ease of access, right? I mean anybody can walk in here, mm -hmm. right? But it's it's a lot easier to sit home and watch it. It's, it's a lot easier to sit home and watch it on a really nice high quality video feed or on on any device or. So uh, that has a lot of a, a appeal for me. So I mean, I would, given that, it, you know, we're certainly not moving the region meetings any anytime soon. Um, I, would, I would certainly be amenable to, uh, by default, having our, our Amherst meetings there. Ms. Spitzer, just one question would yeah. be um, about parking, um, both for us and for the public. I think that's the only accessibility issue that I have with that building is. Some it's confusing. Some spots in Amherst are after six; you have to pay, and some mm -hmm. um, end at six. So, yeah. I don't know how, yeah, how town council deals with it. Yeah, that's a good point. I think um, definitely something that I was thinking about that I was confused about. I saw a couple folks kind of go down this the alleyway next to the town hall. Yeah, is it? <laughs> is that a different parking? It is, okay. It's a secret spot. It's you shouldn't say it too spot. loud. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I understand. Um, but yeah, I think parking is definitely an issue that, you know, uh, potentially. But but at the same time, I would, I would also say that I think parking here can sometimes be an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, because everyone likes to park right here in the fire lane. <laughs> it's always free. It? It's free, that's true. Um, you know, but it can get crowded sometimes depending on what's going on, Dr. Morris. Yeah, and just the, the flip side to that, I don't disagree with your, the point at all, is that in terms of access, in terms of bus routes and people who don't have their own transportation, it's wildly better than this site. This is not an easy site to get to if you do not drive a car. And I know... You're walking. Right, you're, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you're walking some quite, distance. Quite some distance, yeah. Uh, in the winter, so um, I, I think you could look at it either way. I think you're 100 percent right about the parking, but I don't, I don't want to pretend that this is the perfect venue in terms of access. The community, and frankly, just in terms of people knowing where it is, being downtown has some advantage of people generally knowing where town hall. If you have a young, like for an elementary meeting, where is the high school? Even though we listed, thanks to Mr. Schmoland for doing that side entrance right we have actually a fair number of people despite how well we describe it like our attorney who was here earlier tonight who it takes a while and he was still was on the wrong side of the building he was over by the fields and that's why he was like three minutes late so i think it's 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 less cut and dry for me about you know which is more accessible than another i'm wondering if if the committee would be amenable to uh trying it out again yep. having another meeting there um as a school committee and just you know Give it a shot, maybe a shorter meeting, <laughs> with our very strict rules in place <laughs> for engagement. Um, if maybe that might work. I see head nods. Okay, so we'll okay. take a look and see yeah. if maybe you know, uh, maybe even as soon as our next big meeting, yeah. we can we can try that out. Okay, Mr. Nakajima, did you have going another? back to the thing on the agenda? <laughs> yes. uh, are we are we talking about doing math in April then? 
So one thing that I'd like to follow up with the regional chair when he's in the role of regional chair is, is whether, since that's on the agenda for the next regional meeting, whether that could be the first item and perhaps made to be a joint item. Because um, Mr. Sheehan will be back and he's going to have a formal response and it's going to be inclusive of sixth grade. So again, to the same point. Let's, Mr. Find, let's find out later. <laughs> Catch up with the regional chair. Absolutely, I think, uh, I think that would be a good a good choice. Um, and and again, I think you know thinking about April probably is a is a good move. Yeah. Okay. Um, all of that said, I would take a motion, Mr. Nakajima. Move to adjourn. And do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. McDonald. All those in favor? We are adjourned. I want to note that the meeting, this meeting started 15 minutes late because of another meeting, and we are 14 minutes Boom. late, so we are one minute ahead of schedule. We did it. Yeah. Nice yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were